We now call the meeting to order. If you could please rise if you are able and pay attention to Councilwoman Ortiz for the invocation to be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, tonight I'd like to introduce to some and and um, acknowledge Elisa, Alicia Barber, Topeka Police Chaplain, if you'll step forward. Um, first, I want to say she's a Topeka High Trojan. That was not on here. <laughs> hoy, hoy, mighty Troy. <laughs> I want to hear. Um, see, Mr. Henderson, he like he likes those Trojans. Um, Pastor Alicia Barr was a child of God, an ordained minister, a counselor, a motivational speaker, spiritual leader, leader, and healer, a creator, a writer, an illustrator, a chaplain, all through the works of Jesus Christ. Pastor Barber became an assistant pastor at the IYFIC Temple of Deliverance in July of 2018, and serves as the praise and worship leader while also organizing worship services and preaching the gospel. Pastor Barber also serves the community as a chaplain with the Topeka Police Department, and we're glad to have you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We ask that all minds and hearts be open to achieve a common purpose. This is for the betterment of this great city of Topeka. We pray for our council men and our council women. We pray for the mayor and the mayor's office and the community surrounding to make wise and godly <coughs> decisions here tonight concerning the city. Bless these men, bless these women here today. Lord Jesus, that caused the decisions made and brought forth that will be of a common interest for this city. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank We now proceed with the roll call. Mayor De La Isla? Here. Council members Hiller? Here. Aldavia Aqua? Here. Ortiz? Here. Emerson? Here. Padilla? Here. Nager? Here. Dobler? Here. Duncan? Here. And Lesser? Here. We move on to the appointment of the clerk would read. A is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of Paul Post to the Topeka Landmarks Commission for a term ending December 31, 2022. B is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of Mark Ruinhide to the Topeka Landmarks Commission for a term ending December 31, 2022. C is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of Robert, Robert Burquist to the Topeka Tourism Business Improvement District Advisory Board for a term ending December 31, 2021. D is a board appointment recommending the appointment of Meredith Fry to the Topeka Human Relations Commission to fill an unexpired term ending February 10, 2022. And E is a board appointment recommending the reappointment of James Parrish to the Topeka Business Improvement District Advisory Board to fill an expired term ending December 31, 2021. You have heard the appointments. Is there a motion? Councilwoman Hiller. Move to approve. We have a second. Second by Councilwoman Nager. Additional comments or questions? The mayor does not vote. We proceed by voting. We have nine yes. Nine having voting yes, the motion passes. I think that we have here with us this evening Ms. Fry, Mr. Post, and Mr. Burr and Heidi. Could you please rise so that you could be recognized? Thank you so much for your service to our community. We appreciate you being willing to give up your time and your talents for your city. Have a great day. The next, uh, the next item is presentations. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Tonight our first presentation will be done by Bill Finder, our Planning and Development Director. Um, he'll go through our year-end growth management report for the City of Topeka. Bill. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Good evening, Governing Body, Your Honor. Uh, I am pleased to present our year-end <coughs> development uh, and growth management report. 
a lot of exciting things going on last year, very busy, fruitful, uh, and actually even historic. So um, let's just jump into some of the trends that we saw last year. And you'll notice a lot of these because we update you. Uh, not a lot of change since the other quarters that we talked to you about these. By the end of last year, we, we did have a definite uptick in our overall building permit activity. Uh, 472 overall building permits, uh, which was 6% more than the uh, previous year. These aren't all the permits we do. Uh, we actually process four, four to 5,000 uh, other trade permits and other types of permits. These are just the building permits where uh, there is work being done on a uh, building uh, that requires permit. Uh, when you start off looking at where the where that increase came from, um, we'll start off with residential. Our residential actually dipped a little lower than the previous year. This shows you new housing units. Um, new housing units <coughs> uh, being the uh, the red line there. Uh, compared to last year, we were a little bit under. Uh, we did 114 new housing units in the city last year compared to 122 the year before, but it's it's right around our average for the last five years. We tend to do about 118 on average, so not that far off. Pretty um, average, uh, a tick under it. Also, you would see the same trend for the alterations and additions to residential. This was a little, a little bit lower than the new units um, percentages. So we did about 8% less than we did the year before uh, with those types of permits. However, <clears throat> as you look at the new units and where they were occurring, of all the new units in the county, um, the city continues to trend up for where these are <coughs> happening. Uh, this is the third year in a row that we have uh, have increased our share of new units in the county. So this year, or this last year, we were at 53% there on the far right, um, which is our highest concentration of new units in the county since uh, 2011. So that is trending in the right direction with our growth management policies. Where they're happening, this might, you might find this interesting. Um, <clears throat> we haven't uh, shown this in the past, but I always get that question, where are those new units happening? And so this map kind of shows the uh, general locations, there's about nine different areas that have the majority of where those new units were happening. Um, starting out at West, uh, number one there at Miller's Reserve and Sherwood Park. Uh, you, you get into uh, the south, uh, Topeka, uh, number five where Horseshoe Bend is. We even had some duplexes begun uh, behind uh, Gordman's uh, Woodland Court. Um, if you haven't been back there, there's some new development back there. Uh, go out southeast, you still have rock fire being built out, and Aquarian Acres showed a lot of activity. Uh, you come downtown, we had St. Joseph's Lofts uh, done by, uh, he left, Mr. Bernheide uh, was here. Um, and then up north, number nine there, uh, is Woodland Park doing some uh, duplex subdivision up there. So. By and large, that captures where all the new housing is, is going. Uh, so that, we also look at the pipeline for, so that's the new construction. Those are things getting built. But the pipeline, you can kind of get a sense of if there are new uh, platted lots being um, established. This last year, we had 115 new platted lots approved. <coughs> in the city, you approve several of those new subdivisions. Um, and we are um, uh, over eight years worth of inventory though on all of our lots for single and two family. As you can see that 115 lots kind of matches what we do a year for new units, although not all of those new units um, are single family and two family. Um, we still have a lot of inventory of platted lots uh, but it is worth noting that's the highest number of lots that the city uh, that happened in the city since the recession. Uh, so it is we don't normally get that many new lots created 
in the past 10 and 12 years. So it's much in the pipeline. Um, now let's pivot to the commercial activity, which is where we saw a, a big uptick in activity. Uh, 219 commercial permits translated to a 22% increase from last year in permit activity. Uh, that also uh, <clears throat> is higher than our five-year average as well. So a lot of activity on the commercial side of things. Uh, that re has reflected on everything from the square footage. This was the highest num uh, uh, square footage in the last, uh, uh, well, f the fourth highest in the last 20 years. Uh, a very good year from, a, from the size of so large projects happening, a lot of square footage, but even more so on the value side. <coughs> this was the highest year in, in uh, recorded history, which is the last 20 years. Uh, $215 million of permit value, uh, the highest we've had, like I said, in the last 20 years, 100% uh, higher than last year, so uh, doubled the output. So very active, very uh, uh, encouraging, but we had, a lot of, we had a lot of big projects come through, and you saw some of these, you know about them. We usually go through the top 10 permits value-wise. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, kind of deviate a little bit and show you some other things beyond the, the top permits or the, or the big projects that you know about, although um, I'll just start out with that because the top projects generally uh, across the top there with Stormont Vale Event Center being uh, under construction. You've got uh, the Frito-Lay automatic storage um, silos that, that went in out south, Sunflower Foundation up on Menninger Campus. On the bottom row, Wanamaker Hills is, is uh, just about all open now. Um, Washburn Athletic Facility, indoor athletic facility, uh, is definitely going up as if you drive by. Uh, and then Wheatfield, three of the five buildings out in Wheatfield are completed. Um, the fourth one is going up as we speak. So a lot of good top projects there, a lot that you had a hand in in helping get to this point. But there's some other, just I thought I'd throw a few interesting uh, themes going on here. If you've been down South Topeka Boulevard, you may have noticed a lot of activity, building lines uh, between 29th and 31st. We had, I mean, I'm counting here, everything, I throw, throw up five projects here, but you have the core first, headquarters being remodeled. Uh, you've got the new McDonald's, uh, which was a big, big rebuild. You've got uh, Holiday Square Shopping Center, uh, Crunch Fitness, Scooters, Investor Credit, Credit, Credit Union, all going in at the same time. So there's a lot of activity uh, that we just haven't seen there before, which is great to see. Um, and uh, and I, I would just, uh, we think there's, there's more on the way as well, but probably not as much as this. This is a lot. We also saw a theme of public spaces. Uh, last year, you saw Redbud Park up in Noto. Um, you had Claire's Courtyard at the Public Library. And then you also, <coughs> of course, know about Downtown Plaza coming online here in another month or so. So a lot of, a lot of neat. Uh, you, nor, you don't normally get this sort of public space <coughs> development as well. So that, that was a, another theme. And, and lastly, we, have, uh, we do this every year. We have small businesses that you never kind of hear about, but you know about. Uh, as you visit. Just a couple highlighted here. You had everything from uh, out west. You had Aqua Blast, which you know uh, came through for zoning. Uh, that's finally constructed. Brewbank downtown, if you all know about. Um, we, you had a rezoning down southeast for the Milk and Honey Coffee Company at 29th and uh, Powell, I believe. And then lastly, up there on top right, you have a Mi Poblito Market going in. It's a half million dollar renovation in East Topeka, uh, which we hope to have open soon. Uh, I think that's sixth in Swigert for those of you who know the area. So very exciting stuff from a small business standpoint. Very busy year for us from a staff standpoint reviewing these. Uh, we continue to kind of track our numbers and make sure we're uh, having timely uh, approval times. And um, new commercial is still tracking with what we normally do the last couple years. Our remodel reviews went up a little bit there on the right. Uh, and so we have to, again, dig down and ask why that was happening, um, if there's something that's in, in our control. 
And I've shown this to you before as well. We look at all of our review people and our review functions to see if, if they're getting, um, having any anomalies of, of, uh, of uh, longer review times than, than normal. Uh, we didn't really find that so much with the remodel. There may have been a, um, uh, we did have some uh, transitioning over with, with a few of these positions. Um, that, may have, that may have helped, but um, by and large what we see is we did, we did look at our wait times, and so the wait times that when we have it versus when the applicant has the um, uh, permit to respond to, our wait times for staff are, are not as much as the, the applicant. In fact, for instance, on the commercial remodel, um, when the applicant is reviewing our comments, they have it you know, on average 10 days. We have it an average of eight days when we touch it. Um, we're still trying to um, understand and integrate more electronic reviews. We hopefully will have full electronic integration this year with electronic review applications and reviews, uh, which we are, um, ha uh, I'd say, about halfway uh, to full utilization. Uh, we also are looking at some minor reorganizations uh, with some staff to get uh, more timely reviews on the uh, engineering side of things. Um, we also did a stormwater RPI, and we're making changes there as we speak to as because we found stormwater was one of those hangups uh, that we <coughs> often often find during the, during the process. So we are making. Continue to try and have uh, improvement to our process, but a lot of activity, a lot of good trends, uh, and we are seeing that even continue into this first month or two. So um, with that, I'll stand for any questions and comments. Questions or comments for Mr. Fyander. Mr. Do Commissioner, uh, Commissioner, dear gosh. <laughs> <laughs> One week sick and my brain is gone. Councilman yeah. Dobler. <laughs> got, a, got a raise, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Fyander, perhaps a city manager of the top 10, <clears throat> if you go back to that yeah. list, I think no, slide number 10, how many of those facilities are going to be paying full property tax day one? Kind of a rhetorical question, probably, but... It, unless, yeah, the public <laughs> facilities, obviously, you can... Um, but I don't, I'm not aware of all the private ones that are, get, are uh, spinning off tax... Uh, revenue day day one unless they considering if they've got tax incentives uh, abatements of any sort so I would say we Wheatfield have, Village is not correct correct that, that so we there's know. two um, I'd say uh, I, I I can't speak to Sun Sunflower Foundation uh, but, um, nonprofit Nonprofit Frito Lay. I don't know if they had gotten incentives for that tax um, wise. Okay. Wanamaker Hills is tax incentives spinning off yeah. revenue. It's CID, yeah, because um, it was only, but yeah, tax of so sales tax revenue, property tax revenue, um, <clears throat> and then FedEx Freight. Uh, I'm not sure about that one. That was a go that was in the Commerce Park, we'll go Topeka. But, or, uh, that's good. And I'm, I'm yes. yeah. So your rhetorical question is now uh, been answered. Less which, rhetorical. Than, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I guess the point is, as we head into our budget priorities, growth is great, and these are all great. And I know the the numbers on the right hand column indicate people that have jobs and things like that. But the tax revenue, in a lot of cases, is not going to be there. And that uh, that's something we have to deal with down the road. Thanks. Councilwoman yeah. Ortiz to be followed by Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <coughs> I've been asked twice this week, what's the fourth building going up on, at Wheatland? And I couldn't uh, remember the plan. Can you help me with at that? At Wheatfield? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Wheatfield. hotel. Uh -huh. um, the uh, <coughs> Marriott Spring Hill Suites is, are, is on the list there, yes. That's kind of a small hotel, isn't it? 80, 80 to 90 rooms, I believe. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So, uh, four, four story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a hotel. That's <laughs> small people. <laughs> I'll make sure I stay there. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
Um, I had a visit with business uh, leaders in the Noto Arts District and uh, Tom Underwood and some other individuals, and we were talking about the wonderful enhancements with Redbud Park and how it's another added piece into the revitalization of this particular part of District 2 and uh, also into Noto. For those listening, because I do know that there was some folks that I met with that were going to be listening tonight, I want them to understand that I believe the city will do its due diligence with making sure that alleys are resurfaced because it seems to be a problem. <coughs> Parking, ongoing street cleaning as needed to make it as vibrant as some of our other areas of town. I know that that's not your your realm, but this is where I could say it, so I just wanted to give that shout out. Yes, Councilwoman Nigger. I have a quick question about what all is involved whenever the staff does get a applicant's um, information with that eight-day turnaround. What all is incorporated into that? Sure, uh, Councilwoman. So the uh, initial there's an initial review of the plans. So there's construction plans that come with that application, and that gets distributed. Uh, that initial review is the goal is a two week turnaround <coughs> to get comments back to the applicant and those 15 or so people that are functions actually they are sep all separate people that i showed you on that one slide would all get that make their comments within that two week period get it back to the uh, applicants design team uh, to respond back to and so there's usually a, at least one set of back and forth that goes on so mm -hmm. they get the corrections back and that's usually their wait time or uh, that they they hold on to until they get and then we look at it a second time uh, typically and that's a much smaller amount of time which is why it's it shows up as eight mm -hmm. uh, and not 14 days it's so that averages out to that that time but hopefully it's just that a, a two uh, sometimes it goes longer, and you know, one of those pieces, like that's why I said st uh, stormwater, can typically go longer. Um, while everybody else is done, there's one piece that still needs mm -hmm. to be completed, so that that can happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Seeing no questions or comments, thank you so much for your presentation, Mr. Fyander. Mm -hmm. We have another presentation, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, tonight, Chief Cochran is here to do a presentation update on the activities from the SPCP program uh, that were done in 2019, and then talk a little bit about where the program's headed in 2020 and uh, some other initiatives the department will be working on in 2020. Chief? <coughs> Mayor, City Manager, uh, Governor Bobby, uh, for the next three hours, I'll give you an update. <laughs> Uh, so as you can see, this is what we're going to talk about. Um, so the three topics that we're going to hit real quick tonight uh, is the SPCP overview, uh, review of some 2019 numbers, and then 2020 initiatives that we got going on. Uh, so the SPCP, as we know, is the Strengthening Police and Community Partnership. Uh, hopefully everybody got the information I sent you um, for background information. Uh, this here slide is, um, I, I put this form, this uh paper on your desk as well. This is some of the highlights that we uh, have accomplished or that we dealt with over the last two years of uh, doing the SPCP and hitting on some of the high points. Um, but I want to stop real quick. I know we have a couple SPCP members. Uh, are you here? If you'd stand up, please, to be recognized. These are two of the 20-some uh, individuals that have been on this project for the last two years. So. A lot of time and effort has gone into it, and so thank you very much for uh, being present tonight. Uh, but again, this is just some of the things that we have accomplished. Uh, you should have gotten this already, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail over those unless there's questions, and we come back to those. Uh, but the uh, exciting things that we got going on, things that we've done, and again, these are all ideas and things that came up through the meetings and series of meetings that we did with the SPCP uh, panel and then the uh, public meetings and then address them and stuff like that. This is one of the things that, you know, how community involvement, this is a mural that we did put on the uh, police department and the law enforcement center on the north side, and the uh, theme of it is the common ground, and that's coming together to uh, work as a community. 
So going forward, with restructuring uh, the community police unit to become more uh, responsive to uh, the citizens of the PICA. And so that's part of where we're going with the uh, uh, future of the SBCP. Um, expanding the internship program was one of those, how do we bring young people into the city of Topeka? How do we formulate uh, police officers and first responders from within the community of Topeka? And so the internship program has been was very successful. We had 14 young people in uh, uh, the program last year. Of those 14, we ended up hiring six. And so we're extremely excited about that. Uh, this year, we're going to do a lot more focus on state universities, Emporia State, Fort Hay State, Pittsburgh State, uh, including Washburn, uh, as well as continuing those partnerships with Southern Mississippi and Lincoln College. Uh, we expanded our TCOC program. Last year, we made the commitment to the TCOC program out at uh, uh, that center, and that touches junior and seniors. We also made the commitment to uh, be able to reach young people in the freshman class. This year, we're expanding that. So uh, starting in uh, the fall of August, we'll be reaching all four levels of high school, of the four classes in the high schools in USD 501. So it's extremely exciting. And part of that is to help build that foundation going forward that we uh, have young people to draw from within our community. Uh, and then one of the great uh, uh, evolutions of our PAL program is uh, we're looking at, uh, we're starting a boxing program. It's going to be housed out of the Salvation Army over on East 6th Street. And this is something that we're working really close with uh, Council Padilla and uh, Representative Alcala on uh, developing this program. So it's really exciting to reach another uh, segment of our young people. So going forward, uh, when we started the restructuring of the community police, and part of that had to do with being able to attend all the community meetings. And that's, uh, is really resource intensive. Uh, so the SPCP, we were going to do four summits in 2020, one in each police zone, uh, zones one, two, three, and four. So to uh, become more responsive, because we were going to be cutting back on some of those community meetings, is we're going to go to uh, 16 summits this year, uh, four in each police zone. So we finished up the first uh, round uh, last week. We had a uh, very good attendance at several of them, and a lot, some more good ideas came out of that. But going forward, we're going to have uh, one in each police zone. But they're going to be spread out. This first time, they were a little clustered together, you know, Monday through Thursday. It did include a Tuesday, unfortunately, which was a council meeting night. Uh, so the ones going forward, we will be avoiding Tuesdays. And they'll be spread out a little bit more because uh, several of you, uh, your district covers different police zones, you know. So the hopes are that you will be at a couple of the meetings. But that's kind of that. Uh, <clears throat> one of the other initiatives that has come out of this is the... Uh, uh, police community relations program that uh, uh, Kane Davis has been facilitating. Uh, we've had the t first two public meetings to give out information about that. Between the two meetings, uh, we had about 125 people in attendance between the two meetings, which is very exciting because this includes uh, people from all walks of life in the city of Topeka. It's really a community effort, and we're really excited about that. And so the next meeting will be coming up here in a couple of weeks, and that information will be getting out. But it's establishing that partnership between the community and the city of Topeka and the police department that uh, when critical incidents happen, we have a way to move forward and help each other out. So that's uh, kind of the SPCP. Uh, I want to hit on some crime numbers that uh, are concerning and also uh, part of the reason which leads into the 2020 initiatives. Overall crime is down, which is always good. But the unfortunate thing is our violent crime is up, 141 crimes from last year. Violent crime includes your ag assaults, uh, shootings, uh, and, you know, rapes and those type, the part one crimes. And, you know, our shootings were up uh, by 25 from last year. Our domestic violence was up 21 crimes from last year. And so right there between those two, you're talking you know, a little over 50 uh, of the crimes. So those are pretty significant areas that we're, that we're focusing on, which also... Seeing those numbers coming in is what led up to the 2020 initiatives that we got planned uh, that are coming up. Property crimes are down. Homicides, we had uh, 16 uh, last year. Three of those were ruled justified. And then we had 17 in 2018. Uh, this is an important slide and one of interest that I wanted to get across to everybody. We seized a record number of guns off the streets. Uh, felon possessions were up. 
the rest of them all were up. And what's significant to me is that it just tells us we cannot arrest ourselves out of these type of problems. They are truly community problems that we have to work on together. Um, and so you can arrest as many people as you want and, uh, you know, take as many weapons as you want off the streets. But as you see, our violent crime still went up. So there is another factor that comes into that. And that's where this is truly something we have to be involved with the community and the community effort to, to strive to get there. So the initiatives that we got going forward, uh, we have three primary goals out of these initiatives in 2020. And that is we got to change our mindset of how we look at violent crime and how we deal with it. Uh, provide alternatives of violence to young people uh, and, and people that are involved in those type of behaviors and increase the awareness of perceived risk and cost involvement among risky uh, behavior. And so those are the, the goals of our initiatives. Uh, our initiatives are going to focus primarily on these five things. Uh, shooting review team, uh, where we uh, take all the non-lethal shootings and we examine those and look at those for uh, commonalities, characteristics, and stuff like that. Uh, we've really uh, stepped up our NIBINs, which is the uh, gun comparisons and shell casing comparisons, and we are now starting to get some of those results back, which we assumed would be the case, but we now have, um, in two separate incidences, a total of three shootings in different parts of the city, but they're all linked together to the same weapon that was used. So when you have that type of information, you can start knowing your focus a little bit better. Uh, we've had this up and running for about uh, uh, four weeks, and in that time frame, we've uh, taken five guns off the street with this, the team that we have going. Uh, we've uh, executed uh, 39 felony arrest warrants, 28 misdemeanor arrest warrants, uh, 38 felony charges have been filed, and 20-some misdemeanor charges. And so, you know, we're seeing the fruits of that effort of dwelling down into those cases. In the past, what would happen is we'd have a shooting, you go out, you have a property damage, uh, nobody wants to cooperate, or you have an actual shooting victim that doesn't want to cooperate. So what we do is basically you just move on because you had nothing to go on. What we're doing is two or three days later, we're going back to those cases, re-talking to individuals, re-talking to victims, and, you know, uh, and so we're making some headway with that, but that's uh, it, it, pretty exciting, the results that we're getting out of that already. So, uh, And then the SAVE pro, uh, efforts that we got going with the Center for Peace and Justice, uh, which was initiated through the JUMP uh, uh, organization. And so we're getting, we're getting that in, in place. We're working on getting the funding to uh, get a program director hired. And once we do that, uh, we'll, that'll be an exciting endeavor as well there. Um, the gun and tell us, the CGI, that's what I talked about, the Nibens efforts and stuff like that. Uh, it's really exciting. We're sending four officers to uh, Huntsville, Alabama to get them trained into how to enter Nibens, and we'll have a cooperation uh, with the KBI in which those officers will be entering those type of things so we can get a turnaround. Uh, Nibens used to take about uh, anywhere six to eight months to get a results back. Now with the new technology, once that uh, shell casing and firearm is entered into the system, uh, we get a turnaround of 48 hours. And so you get real-time, up-to-date uh, intel on that. So that's exciting. Uh, the executive research firm, uh, PERF, that we've been working with, they'll be in town on February 19th. And it'll be the final of the final drafts of a program which uh, Topeka, Kansas, will be the model on how uh, law enforcement agencies across the United States respond to uh, non-lethal shootings. And a lot of that had to do with the things that we have going on. That's why we were chosen for this. And this project's been going on right out about uh, two years. And so the final step for publication will be September. But uh, they'll be here in, in town um, February uh, to finalize that. And then uh, the other thing is evidence-based policing. We really stepped up our intelligence efforts. Uh, we've purchased an enhanced software program that now will tie us into law enforcement agencies across the United States in which you can enter a suspect's name or a vehicle description or a tag number and it'll search the databases for all these law enforcement agencies across the, the country and so you can track individuals where they're coming and going. And so, uh, you know, a lot of our individuals, when they get in trouble or they think they're going to be in trouble, mm -hmm. they'll go to Kansas City or they'll go to Wichita and they have the same uh, uh, information uh, database and technology there that we can now mine that information out of that. 
so a lot of good things like that going on. But that's, I know that was really quick. Um, uh, I, I could go on for three hours, but I won't. But, <laughs> uh, Thank you for sparing us. <laughs> Comments or questions for Chief? Councilman Padilla. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I want to ask you, um, and I think I know the answer, but um, these efforts uh, don't happen in a vacuum, and I appreciate that you have a lot of partners in this effort. Um, how is it uh, coordinated with any efforts with the Shawnee County Sheriff's Office? Uh, we're pretty much in lockstep with the Sheriff's Office. They attend all the meetings. We attend their meetings. Uh, a lot of information sharing through there. And so uh, when we talk about a lot of these efforts, uh, they do tie into the Sheriff's Office. What's really great with that partnership is they've established a relationship with some of the neighboring counties. And so now we actually uh, have more of a, a connecting county uh, effort when it comes to a lot of our individuals because they go to different counties and they come back and forth. It's like one of the individuals that we're really uh, focusing on in the uh, gun violence initiative um, travels, lives in Lawrence, but comes over to Topeka uh, and back and forth almost on a daily uh, pace. So those are things that we work on those partnerships. So we have a great partnership with the Sheriff's Office and it's an extremely important partnership. Good, thank you. One more. Yes, sir. Uh, as a follow-up as well, I know uh, property crimes have always seemed to be a, a, a problem. Uh, it's, it's difficult to, to get any real headway on that. But I know working with you, we've done some things to um, revitalize the Neighborhood Watch program. And I was visiting just before this meeting tonight. And I know since that revitalization that there have been increased numbers of Neighborhood Watches put in place, and um, how much can uh, the community do to help uh, the, the department in, you know, looking out for each other in that neighborhood for these property crimes <coughs> that happen when most people are either at work or asleep? Well, Councilman, that's a dual-edged sword for me because, mm -hmm. as you noticed, our property crimes are down. Yeah. But with these enhanced, enhanced efforts, they're probably going to be up in 2019. Uh, but a part of that is that partnership. The Neighborhood Watch Program is a, a, a great program, and we really have worked a lot to revitalize that. Hopefully people have seen the new signs that have gone up. We've rebranded it as well. And so when we talk about the neighbors looking out for neighbors, you know, um, a lot of time it doesn't warrant a 911 call, mm -hmm. but it does warrant a call to the police department or to the sheriff's office that if you see something suspicious or you see a car that doesn't belong or you see somebody walking around in the neighborhood where you wouldn't normally see a person walking in that area unless they had a reason to be there, live there per se. Um, so we encourage people to notify us, give us a call. Uh, we also instituted that new email address. Hopefully everybody's seen that. Tell, tell TPD at Topeka.org. Uh, real simple email address where if you see something, um, you know, maybe you're on your way into work, you saw something, you can send an email to us when you get to work. And so all that information feeds directly into our intelligence unit. And so uh, when we, we talk about, you know, see something, say something, that's true. And uh, again, a lot of times people don't want to leave their name or whatever. And so with an email account, you do usually have a name with it. But it's also a way for people to provide easy information uh, if you, you know, can give us tags, vehicle descriptions, the person description. And so looking out for your neighbors is extremely important. If, if you know a lot of your neighbors work and you're at home during the day and, uh, you know, look out for them. And it's also like when packages get delivered, you know, mm -hmm. if you can ask a neighbor to, hey, can I drop it off at your, your place or have it sent to your place or whatever, look out for each other is what we're, we kind of talk about. And, you know, we got National Night Out coming up. That's another great endeavor by PARS and Safe Streets with the Neighborhood Watch Program as well. And, you know, that's one of those things. We really ask people to, to get involved in those things and really meet their neighbors or have an understanding of who they are or what they drive or where they go and, and things like that so they can help each other out. Okay. What was that email address again? Tell TPD at Topeka.org. Thank you, Chief. Councilwoman Hiller to be followed by Councilwoman Nader. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I very much appreciate the initiatives as well as the partnerships, and this is an exciting piece. 
I do have two questions. One is, um, it sounds like within this, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got the police community relations going on, and I'm not sure we've described yet exactly what opportunities to get engaged are with that. And then we have the SPCP, and is the SPCP as an organization, um, I don't know if it's retaining its 20 people or whether you need people, and then these quarterly meetings, um, kind of across the board, if you could give us an idea of what we can do to help <coughs> to make sure that those are working for everybody. Yeah. The uh, Police Community Relations is a piece of the SBCP. The SBCP is that Strengthening Police Community Partnership. So the Police uh, rela Community Relations is an opportunity for people to come together and be involved in a process that when a critical incident happens involving the police department or the city of Topeka, we have individuals that we have been working with, that we have a uh, trust factor with, that they trust us, we trust them, that we can come together and help the city of Topeka move forward through that difficult situation. And it's not for us to tell you that, hey, we're right. It's not for you to tell us, hey, we are wrong. It's that opportunity to come to that common ground to say, how do we move the city forward in a productive manner? Mm -hmm. And so how can council members help us with that is one, uh, the SPCP, we, we have lost some of those individuals out of the original 20, and we need to get you know individuals back re-engaged in that. And so even if you weren't involved in the SPCP in the first two years, if you want to get involved in that, you know, contact us, and uh, you know we get you involved in that. And then that uh, police community relations, if you want to be involved in that, we can get you in touch with Dr. Uh, with uh, Kane Davis, who is, is running that program. I was thinking beyond just ourselves personally. Um, you know, sometimes we have people from our districts who are, have concerns and want to get involved and make a contribution. Or if you're looking more for people who have their feet in the in the crime community or that you know that are bridging the community didn't know exactly what you were looking for to participate because the PCR actually has has a is a group that you can there's a graduation tomorrow night right and so there you can actually get whoever the right people are in a group to participate and and build a, build that team over time right yeah um, in the uh, the uh, Strategic Leadership Academy is, it graduates tomorrow night as well. Um, what we're looking for, it, it's really just another opportunity to enhance things. Uh, and that's what that the Police Community Relationship Program is all about. Just, you know, what else can we do? Help, and anybody can be involved. Okay. And it, we're not looking for anybody specific. We're not looking for, uh, you know, we want... This type of person, it, it is if you want to be involved in the city of Topeka, you want to help make it a better place to be, live, and play, this is an opportunity to be involved. <clears throat> so we could refer them to you then, interested Yeah, you can, you can have them notify, okay. get a hold of the police department. And, uh, yeah, I didn't mean for you as council members personally to be involved. <laughs> what I'm saying is when you run across individuals that say, hey, how can I be involved or what can I do, you got a place to send them. Okay. Thank you. And if I could ask that second question, um, there are, I appreciate Councilman Padilla's question because a lot of, you know, there are neighborhoods where people feel like the property crime is just supporting those guys <laughs> in their gun activity. And so if people have this, I think everyone appreciates the gun violence initiative, but if people are concerned and would like to have some input or involvement in issues of property crime or other issues such as, um, Traffic issues, you know, I've talked about those recently. Mm -hmm. um, with people running red lights all over town or whatever it might be, speeding in certain places in neighborhoods or other community relations issues, is there a place for those folks to connect in with at this Yeah, time? and that's why we developed that email address, tltpd at topeka.org. That's really the easiest way. Whenever you have those type of concerns or whatever, and you're, you're extremely right, Councilwoman Hiller, that property crime drives a lot of our other crimes. Uh, and when you talk about guns, to date, we've already had 19 firearms stolen out of cars. To date. You know, that's about nine more than last year. So 
when we talk about property crimes, property crimes are extremely important because it kind of helps set the tone as to what that neighborhood's going to be like. And so working with uh, neighborhood partners and things like that, we, we, we have to address those issues. If I could follow that up with one more. <laughs> yes, you restructured the community policing unit into a, and I f always forget the name of it. Problem-oriented policing. Problem-oriented policing. Is that one particularly gun oriented or what kinds of things is that group likely to pick up and work on? They're, they're going to be doing all the same things that the community officers did prior. They're still community officers, but, uh, you know, Council Emerson and I have been in contact, have been in conversation about some property crimes that they're having. So when we're up to where we have this running, that would be where, okay, this, this team could go out and focus on those type of community uh, type crimes that are affecting the community, which a lot of times are property crimes. And so, you know, that's how that really works. And so when we have those uh, particular areas identified or things that we can address, that's what the, the, the team concept on the problem oriented policing would do. And in that case, people would contact that unit directly. They could, like I said, that tell TPD okay. is we'll really work. the easiest way. Okay. What we're trying to do is find a way that we can simplify it as easy as we can for the for everybody that lives in the city of Topeka. That if I send it just to this, it'll be filtered out uh, and and get to get to the right person. But that way, we don't have to worry about well, contact this unit, contact that unit, or whatever. One central location, and that's what we're really trying to push home with that email address. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman Nager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I had contacted you earlier this year. I have been to several NIA meetings and neighbor other neighborhood meetings talking about the restructuring of the community police unit. What's the best resource for those neighborhoods to go ahead who are already organized or those looking to get organized? to get um, connected with the community police unit? Well, we simplified that email address also, CPO, mm -hmm. okay. community police officer, CPO at Topeka.org. Mm -hmm. And so if you send an, e send an email to that, uh, you know, that's one of the things I was talking with, uh, um, with Judy Wilson from Safe Streets and Pars, you know, just before the meeting today. We're not, not going to be going to all neighborhood meetings. We just cannot attend all of them. But if you have a specific issue or something, and you can tell your neighborhood partners that, hey, if you, you, know, you have a meeting coming up in three weeks and you really have something you really would like addressed, if you get a hold of us in plenty of time, we can, we can probably get somebody there uh, to make it. But also, by contacting that email address, we can also relay information back to them as far as stats and things like that, mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of people still want those things that are, were provided by the community officers in those meetings, but that information is still available. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's probably a, uh, my fault that I, that I didn't explain that properly, that all that information is still there. We okay. still have it. It's still accessible. Uh, so you can contact that CPO at Topeka.org, and we can get you Perfect. any type of stats or whatever. Awesome. Thank you very much. Chief, um, I have a question. So you have this website that is working. What are metrics that you are, so like are people to expect a response from somebody in the TPD within a certain amount of time, letting them know that they're looking into it? Is there going to be follow-up or is it just simply more of a, I saw something, I'm giving out that information? <clears throat> Well, in email, we can usually tell by the way the email conversation goes when they send us something that they want to be contacted back. And if they do, we'll contact them back. Uh, but if it's one of those things, hey, I was driving into work today and I saw this, I just want to let you know, probably not going to respond to that one. Okay. Councilman Duncan. I just have a quick comment and then a question. I did go to the Thursday night meeting that was in my district at Crestview, and I want to thank you, but mostly your officers who were all there from the unit and took a lot of time to talk with people and answer their questions. And the information was great, and I appreciated the honest answers. Not always what you want to get back, but at least your, your folks gave them to us. So I think that was important for the community folks who were there. Um, the second thing is we are now four months-ish into having our independent police auditor. And I'm just curious, how's that going from your perspective? And, and what's that relationship like? And how's that new position transition been? Well, I think it's going great. Um, we just had a sit down conversation yesterday after the SBCP meeting. Uh, we have monthly meetings now scheduled with the city manager where uh, uh, Mr. Colazzo will look at, you know, present information to the city manager and we'll talk about it if there's any potential issues. Uh, 
what's uh, really interesting is that we're, we're getting feedback on things that, um, you know, maybe need a little more practice or we need a little more work in uh, that will be identified. So uh, I'm extremely pleased with it so far, and I see nothing but more positive things coming out of it. I think this was really a great move by the city of Topeka for the citizens of Topeka because it is a, truly an individual who is outside of the police department um, that actually has eyes on the police department that has conversation directly with the city manager. So uh, it's exciting, and I know uh, a lot of times it, it scares people at first when you do something like this, uh, and we're working through that, but uh, I think it's an ex extremely exciting time for us. City Manager, the Councilwoman Heller. The other thing I'll add, real quick, Councilman Duncan, is that we, there will be a report that comes to the to the governing body related to the activities of the independent police auditor. We're just getting to that stage. The first one will be produced and forwarded around. So you'll be getting information on a regular basis regarding his activities within regards to his job. Councilwoman Heller. Thank you. Quick follow up to your comment about the two email addresses. If I could make a suggestion, and that would be to always ha have a default short one-liner, but always acknowledge the emails. I can't think of how many times people have said, not just to, with the police, well, I called the city, but I don't even know if anybody got the message. Yep. And if there was simply a simple thing that said, you know, maybe you assess it as to whether they've asked for a response or not, for the ones that didn't, just to say, thank you so much for letting us know. If you want us to respond, let us know at this number or, you know, at this email right. or number, and then, then people, they'll feel so much better about it. Yeah, I agree. Um, and that was more of a general statement. Okay. I, I'm the same way. When I send an email, I, I look for know. some type of fee feedback, you know, whether it's got it or okay, thanks, mm -hmm. whatever. So you raise a very valid point, and it's really easy to do with the email system. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Additional questions or comments for the chief? Seeing none, Chief, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. We now move on to the consent agenda, if the clerk would read. <coughs> oh, you want me to make the statement about, yes. Okay. I have it here somewhere. Okay, so the city clerk is requesting that item 4E be withdrawn from the consent agenda because it's a duplicate item of item 4C. So if there is consensus with that, seeing consensus from the council, um, then I think that we can proceed with the city clerk reading the agenda. A is an ordinance introduced by city manager Brent Trout allowing and approving city expenditures for the period of November 30, 2019 through January 3, 2020 and enumerating said expenditures therein. B is a resolution introduced by council member Karen Hiller approving a special event known as the African American Travel Conference. C is a resolution introduced by Council Member Karen Hiller granting the Celtic Fox an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seat concerning noise prohibitions. D is a resolution introduced by Council Member Karen Hiller approving a special event known as the 2020 St. Patrick's Day Street Party. E has been withdrawn. F are minutes of this special meeting of February 1, 2020 and the regular meeting of February 4, 2020 and there are no applications. You have heard the consent agenda. What is the pleasure of the body? Mm -hmm. We have a motion by second. Councilwoman Ortiz and a second by Councilman Padilla. Comments or question on the consent agenda? Seeing none, we proceed by voting. We have 10 yes. 10 having voting, voted yes, the motion passes. We now move on to item five, the non-action item. Action uh, item A at the corporate read. A is discussion and update on Topeka's existing housing conditions and citywide market demand, as well as a general update on the housing study project. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, tonight is an important night in regards to our efforts to understand better where our city stands in relation to our housing stock. Um, the presentation tonight on our citywide housing marketing study and strategy will be done by mar uh, market strategies. Um, I'd like to ask Justin Carney and Andy Feaster to please come forward and <coughs> present. Great, thank you. Uh, <coughs> I don't have control of the presentation. Just use the tab button. 
buttons here. Oh. All right. Well, I don't seem to have the first slide I expected. That's all right. <laughs> Mayor, council members, city officials, uh, thanks for the time tonight. Uh, my name is Justin Carney. Uh, I'm uh, with Andy Feaster um, uh, from Development Strategies, and we are doing, uh, we are conducting the citywide housing market study and strategy. And I appreciate the time tonight to give you a quick update on where we're at. Um, and uh, it will be a very quick update. I, th things like this um, are very dense uh, from a housing policy and planning perspective. Um, we can you know, geek out on this stuff and spend a lot of time talking. Um, but what I think I'm going to do is really give it a high level shot um, for all of you to get a sense of where we're at over the last six months of work and kind of where we're headed uh, both today and tomorrow with the meetings that we have as well as the next couple of months. Um, and uh, and then leave some time for you all to ask the questions and, and dive in wherever you'd like to. Uh, so as I said, we're about six months into a nine, eight, eight or nine month process. Uh, we've been at this since September. We've been here a couple of times already. This is our third trip. Um, that uh, does not uh, really wrap its arms around the weekly calls that we have with the uh, with the client team, uh, with with city staff, uh, as well as. Uh, the, the numerous follow-up calls that we have with uh, stakeholders and folks that are very interested in this and that are reaching out and making sure that we have the information uh, that we need. Uh, we're at, as you can see here, step three, strategy phase, the strategize phase. We're moving um, you know, through our understanding, talking to stakeholder groups, our housing analysis, which I believe Andy may have given you a very quick brief on uh, back in December. Uh, so we're putting together and kind of setting the table on the strategies. Um, it's important to note this is not sort of the recommended strategies as far as a final report goes. That's going to happen uh, in April. But uh, what this is, is it's, it's our comprehensive uh, kind of toolbox, if you will, of strategies that, that we think um, should be considered as part of this study and strategy. And we'll be refining those um, from meetings we had today and, and a couple of meetings tomorrow with the steering committee and stakeholder group. When we think about the housing study, we're looking at this in really three different kind of components. Um, understanding the needs, of course, is very important. Understanding needs not only of affordability, um, but also kind of the other end of affordability into market rate, uh, housing, everything in between, and even sort of what, what's, what you might say goes off the edge of affordability, where we're talking about housing stability for homelessness, um, folks you know, facing eviction. Um, all of that gets considered within this. Uh, another component is housing diversification. Uh, and it's just, you know, what is the housing stock that is here? What is needed to meet the needs that we were, uh, the, you know, uh, along that affordability spectrum? And uh, sometimes that's new construction, sometimes that's rehabilitation. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then there, a third component really is the uh, kind of looking at the urban core reinvestment. Um, this is a citywide housing study and strategy, so we're looking at, the, at these issues in a citywide context, but understanding how housing may support uh, reinvestment in your urban core and reinvestment in, in kind of dis, uh, disinvested neighborhoods is also a, a very key component of this. As we think about, um, you know, have we been mark walking through the market analysis, uh, uh, just a real quick summary of the findings. Um, you know, we're really seeing uh, here with the analysis that we're doing, the conversations with the, that we're having, a real mismatch with the current housing stock of what you have um, with um, both what is being asked for by residents that currently live here as well as what uh, the demand might be for residents that you might want to be attracting. Um, and, and attracting and train, uh, retaining population and workforce, and we're seeing a mismatch there. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about housing stability, the issue of homelessness and eviction, um, you know, as I said, that, that is really a subset of this affordability conversation has been an issue that has been brought up repeatedly from your stakeholders and uh, is, you know, borne out in the data, and, uh, you know, that needs to be addressed. And then also understanding how housing fits with economic growth. Um, within the, and, and the growth and potential of what you're trying to do in other areas, um, particularly downtown, is, is, has also been an issue uh, that has come up. And you can, you can see the data, the implications here, um, the need, as I said, for a spectrum of affordability, uh, not only housing stock, but services for people and families, um, and, and, and then understanding how housing and economic development can fit together. 
This is a great summary of the housing, de housing analysis, the demand analysis that we did. Uh, the light blue that you can see on the left there uh, really is, the, the light blue is rental, the dark blue is uh, for sale, uh, owner occupied housing. You can see that there's a real demand for affordable rental units on one side of the spectrum there. Uh, and then on the other side, um, you can see that there is still quite a demand for moderate, um, you know, moderate for sale housing units. Um, one of the real challenges when you're looking at that 100 and, uh, you know, 120 to, to 220 or 180 to 275 thousand dollar unit, um, you know, again, we're not we're talking about affordability at the other end of the spectrum. It's difficult to build this and have developers turn a profit and, ma and make that a viable product. And so you're seeing demand for that um, and, and, and kind of a, a, a lack of that within your housing stock. So this is uh, the, the, really the demand summary that we're seeing. Um, and uh, you know we could go into a lot of details here, but I think that gives you a sense of, at least from a housing stock perspective, what we're talking about. So now we're going to kind of get in, we're moving from the analysis phase into the strategy phase, and we really look at strategy with these three components, um, stabilization, marketability, opportunity. Um, on the stabilization side, you know, we're talking about the stabilization of housing stock, of stabilization of neighborhoods, um, you know, what is, what is there, but it's also the stabilization of families and households and how do you stabilize their situation. A little bit of that is economic development, it's wages, it's getting the right kind of jobs to allow them to afford it. But even for those that aren't able to, you know, that, that need more of an, you know, on that affordable end of the spectrum, um, there's still some critical issues of, of eviction and being able to, you know, live month to month that makes their housing situation unstable that we're talking about uh, in, that, in that context. Marketability is, is just that, it's what is the market for different types of housing? Um, you know, what is, you know, what is the, the types that are being asked for? Um, what is being supplied? Um, where's the quality? Where's the amenities? Where do they exist in your, in, within your city and how do you promote that? And then the opportunity piece is again, kind of that intersection of housing, neighborhood stabilization, economic development, transportation, all of the issues that, that we know touch housing and that housing touch as well. Um, a lot of the issues, you know, policy and infrastructure investment that you deal with on a, on a, on a monthly basis comes into play there. While we may not be necessarily addressing this component of the strategy, you'll see that a lot of, uh, several of the strategies we are promoting will touch on some facet of that. Just a representation of kind of where we're at within this. We are focused on a housing study and strategy. And so we also know, as I said, that housing impacts neighborhood stability, economic development, equity, infrastructure planning, um, you know, and, and all of these issues come into play. Um, we don't ignore them. Housing doesn't exist in a vacuum, but we will not be addressing some of these broader issues uh, directly. The strategies really fall into three categories. Uh, and development is really talking about new housing stock, what's here, what's not here, and how do we get what, what needs to be here. Um, stabilization, I've talked about that. It's the existing housing stock and how do you address um, meeting, uh, you know, improving the quality and, and, uh, and, and safety of existing stock. And then you're going to see strategies around people and families and households and how do you support those, um, you know, both that are trying to find housing that may not have it, as well as those that have it and want to keep it or are looking to move up. One key component of this strategy conversation that we'll have uh, is a feasibility analysis, a high level feasibility analysis. We will be looking at kind of what does it take to develop new housing? Land costs, construction costs, soft costs. What does it take for a developer to develop a, a unit? Um, whether that's a multifamily building and, and the units in there or a single family unit. And then based on the market analysis, what is the value that a developer could expect to get? Oftentimes those don't meet and where they don't meet, that's where you need incentives, that's where you need resources to begin to fill that gap in order for your development to community to come in and provide the housing stock that you need. <coughs> Just a representation really of, of kind of what the different areas are, as I said, new multifamily, new single family, if you're going to gut rehab a single family house, if you're just going to renovate, all of these have different costs associated with them and different gaps associated with them. And what this really begins to impact then is, 
if it's a forty thousand dollar gap for uh, let, let, let's go to the single family if it's a sixty thousand dollar gap to, to develop a new single family housing unit and you could get a thirty thousand dollar gap to to do a gut rehab and a smaller gap if you just renovate housing stock that you have you can see that your limited resources then give you more units depending on where you're at within that spectrum um, you know, this is not all going to be guided by the feasibility. It's just another piece of the conversation. Um, I still think, you know, and you'll see uh, strategies that hit all of this and, and you'll, you'll see your impacts on how many units you can provide with the amount of resources that you have. When you start to blend the demand, uh, as I, the, the demand analysis with the feasibility analysis, you start to really get a sense, and this is where you know things start to come together to really inform the strategy. You start to get a sense of, okay, if there are 4,300 4, households in the demand pool, demand pool for subsidy-dependent housing, and you know there's a gap of 100,000 per unit, you can begin to see what this means for how much, um, you know, a real scale of what the need is. And so it's a real scale. The demand tells us a real scale of how many units are there. When you start to overlay the feasibility analysis, you start to see what is the real scale of the resources that are needed. And uh, this is just, a, like, I, like I said, a high, a high level feasibility estimate that over 10 years, um, when you add up all of the units across this you know, strategy types and the gaps that are associated with that, you could be seeing a $53 million need each year for 10 years just to meet the demand that we're seeing that is out there for affordable units. Now, that's big. <laughs> and, uh, you know, really it is just to give you a sense of kind of the urgency and the scale of the situation. Obviously, the recommendations are not going to say, and, you know, the city needs to come up with $53 million a year to, to combat this issue. Um, a couple of things come into play here. One is it gives you a sense of the scale, but it also gives you a sense, and we'll talk a lot when we're when we're looking at the strategies and it's been part of our message with the with the stakeholders and the steering committee that it really you know everyone says it takes a village right to, to raise a family well it takes what we call you know that housing ecosystem to 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 create the kind of housing that you need and to meet the needs that you have so that 53 million is not just you know it's not saying that that's what the city needs but that that's what is needed and so then when you've got developers <laughs> philanthropists, um, you know, equity investors, and you've got other partners at the table, that's where you start to see that combining of resources, as well as additional, you know, city resources, wherever they may come from. Um, but that's, that's, again, just to kind of give you a sense of that, uh, of that scale. So that's just some of the data. Um, you know, what are we trying to achieve? When we started this kickoff back in September, we had two days worth of uh, about a dozen stakeholder interviews. And these were some of the issues that we heard. Um, you know, the need for quality housing stock, um, you know, a focus on neighborhoods, uh, a focus on families and supports, both to keep people in housing and get people into housing if they're not there. Um, you know, and again, kind of that spectrum of housing affordability and housing needs. Um, on the affordable side, people are telling us they want, they need affordable housing. On the other end of the market, we had large employers saying we have a hard time attracting, uh, you know, um, executive level talent to come and live in Topeka um, because there's not that end of the housing stock that, that they're able to find and, 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 and desire. And so again, kind of that spectrum. Uh, that we were looking at. What we heard, we, you know, this plus the data, we, we quickly turned these into a variety of housing goals. Um, we're talking about neighborhood services, household services, um, you know, understanding the role that the developers, the landlords, the city, the service providers all play within this ecosystem. You're gonna hear me, you're gonna hear me say that word a couple of times, right? Um, and just what, whatever that invokes in your mind, if it's an environmental ecosystem, it's all of the pieces that make the environment, well, that's what this is for the housing. It's all of the pieces that make that housing environment. <coughs> so I breezed through that. That's all, you know, there, there, there's, there's pages upon pages and, 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 and days upon days of analysis that have gone into that. But I think it gives you a sense, again, of kind of where, where you're at with, with the need um, for, for housing um, in Topeka. And what we've put together, um, 
with with input from uh, the city staff and, and as I said just kind of filling out the, the conversations that we've had with a variety of stakeholders we've put together these six strategies six bu buckets of strategies if you will um, it's looking at existing housing stock it's looking at, at you know abandoned and vacant properties which really leads to neighborhood stabilization um, talking about expanding the resource resources for that housing stability and home ownership support Again, this is where we're going to talk about evictions. This is where we're going to talk about um, homelessness and, and kind of the supports needed there. Talked about a mix of the need for a mix of housing type and diversity of housing types. Um, one of the things I'll mention here, because we won't really get into strategy four tonight in my presentation, but we can definitely talk about it, is that this diversity of housing type, this is a, this is a phenomenon at cities across the country. You've got a lot of single family housing multifamily housing and not much in between and so what that is doing is it's really impacting uh, the affordability you know of people maybe being able to not buy a single family home but being able to afford more than an apartment so wh what about duplexes row town homes fourplexes sixplexes something that just creates a diversity of that housing stock within your neighborhoods and along your corridors um, you know, people, there's a growing, um, there's a growing demand for that. Households are changing. They don't necessarily all want single family homes anymore. So what's there and what can you develop um, that, that, that they can, you know, find, find uh, that they can move into. Expanding the production of affordable housing, um, you know, to enhance economic mobility. We're, you know, again, we're kind of, this is that intersection where we don't spend a lot of time. We do talk about location and where some of this investment should go, but it's, it's linking transportation investments, uh, neighborhood safety, neighborhood stabilization in areas around employment centers and in, in areas around, you know, your education centers and how can housing support economic development and education and, and, and attainable opportunities. And then the sixth one there is just expanding that financial and organizational capacity. That's the capacity of the city and the city departments that directly impact housing, but it's also organizational capacity of all of the partners that play a piece. Community development, uh, community development corporations, uh, financial institutions, your neighborhood, uh, you know, your neighbor, your NIAs, all of them can play a role and maybe an expanded organization or role beyond what they're doing now. So I'm going to quickly get through, uh, yeah, I spend a little more time, I guess, highlighting the six of those. We're going to touch on, on four of them and, and happy to, again, to kind of answer any questions on this. Um, when we're talking about strategy number one and, and talking about the existing housing stock, one of the, one of the key things that you can do, um, one of the key strategies is a weatherization program. Um, you know, it's exploring you know, new funding or finding existing funding that you may not, may not already be tapping into um, to expand what those programs are. And a lot of weatherization programs also focus on owner-occupied housing. Well, what happens if you expand those programs into rental housing? and be able to impact perhaps the utility bills and the affordability of rental units, which are, your, are, are some of your most vulnerable you know, uh, population uh, is, is your renters. And so how can you begin to maybe target some of these weatherization programs into areas that do directly impact your, um, your, your, your more um, uh, sensitive home uh, renters and, and population and you can see we've just got some positive impacts of re the, the weatherization programs here you can see the cost energy savings that could be the you know trickled down from property property owners to renters um, and you start to see also um, you know the kind of the return on non-energy you know investments so for every dollar you invest in energy and weatherization improvements you get about almost three dollars of non-energy benefits due to health care due to not missed work Work, et cetera. Another piece of this, um, you know, strategy is just home repair programs, and you know, exploring a variety of ways that you can support, um, you know, home repair. And you can see here, um, you know, a, a couple of um, a couple of examples of that: waiving permitting fees on renovations, um, expanding what uh, you know the resources that you have within, uh, and, and improving neighborhood conditions. Um, those neighborhood conditions can also really support somebody wanting to make an investment in their home, and those two things go hand in hand. 
Uh, it's talking about you know, finding qualified contractors, bringing them into targeted neighborhoods and saying, this is where we'd like, to, you'd like you to invest and we have supports or incentives to do that, but we want you to do it here, not elsewhere. Um, those are just a couple of examples. If you had a $5 million fund for a home repair program, just this feasibility analysis here, you know, it, it, it could be around a, a, a $20,000 per unit, um, you know, forgivable loan program, perhaps. Um, if you had a $5 million fund, you could be talking about 250 homes that would be repaired. And you can see kind of on that more affordable workforce home ownership side of things. This is important because when you start thinking about what it takes to build a home and maybe the gap and the feasibility gap that the city would have to do there versus maybe 20,000 and getting you know, 250 homes for your $20,000 investment for all of them versus the fewer homes you know, with a larger gap uh, when you're building new, it really starts to point at why you want to really work with improving the housing stock that you have. Uh, we also know, you know, abandoned and vacant properties are an issue. Uh, foreclosure was a big issue. It, it hit communities, you know, hard. Um, and, uh, you know, being able to turn the corner from that, um, you know, it is important. Uh, we've got a couple of different examples here of, of how the city um, could be, you know, looking at tackling this, this, uh, this vacancy and, and abandoned property piece. You know, one of these is a land bank. Um, and that is, you know, where you could have, um, you know, a, it's a new tool where the city could come in, um, identify properties that need to be acquired that may have to, you know, title issues. Um, and, and how can the city take a more active role in targeting those strategic areas, acquiring those properties, clearing the title, and then possibly transferring those again to other partners that you would have that would then rehabilitate the, the units that might be there or build on the vacant properties. This would be a real sort of strategic effort. Um, you know, the, if you just start looking at your different neighborhoods and just picking one, you know, here and there, um, it's not quite as impactful as perhaps targeting neighborhoods and doing this in a very programmatic and comprehensive way. And uh, you know that this is one opportunity for that. We've got land banks, um, you know, all across Kansas that have you know that utilize this tool to um, to, as I said, target the, the the vacant, the abandoned properties, and then work with developers to to rehabilitate and, and redevelop those areas. Another piece is code enforcement. Um, you're doing it now, and um, you know, really just having continued. Consistent code enforcement efforts is also very much a part of how do you maintain the housing stock that you have. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, there's a lot that goes into this, right? It's uh, the need for you all to prioritize resources um, and, and give city staff the resources that they need to, to, to inspect and enforce the, all of the properties that, that, that you need to. Um, but there's also, you know, kind of what is the response to that? <laughs> There's certainly the kind of the punitive violation piece, um, especially when you have chronic, you know, repeat offenders and how do you get them into the court system? But then also, how do you get the court system to understand why is this important? And we work in communities all the time where the municipal judges and that, that process, once it gets there, you know, they're prioritizing them, their, their workload and they're saying, eh, property maintenance, that's, that's not as high up on my ladder as, 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 you know, some of these other crimes the chief was talking about or, or what have you. So how do you get them to understand that this is important and that this is impacting neighborhood safety, stabilization and these bigger pictures and, and getting enforcement in there? Um, but then there's also sort of the remediation side. When you're looking at code enforcement and doing proactive code enforcement, what other supports do you have out there? in other departments or with other community partners to help people address those violations when they're in that process. All of this, again, kind of, uh, you know, uh, dealing with and, and trying to prevent, I guess, the, the um, abandoned and vacant properties. Quickly with, uh, you, know, ex you know, stability of home ownership. And really this is, you know, talking about the pre prevent and address homelessness and eviction. And, um, you all are part of the conversation, you know, regularly, I'm sure. And we have heard it repeatedly from stakeholders that, um, you know, homelessness, getting people into quality housing, as well as eviction and preventing people from losing the housing they have um, is a very significant issue. Um, you know, we're talking about 
sometimes financial assistance to keep people being, you know, that might be on the edge of, they can make their rental payments um, and they can make all their other budgetary payments, but then man, when they get hit with that $400 car repair or that $400 medical bill, suddenly that makes that, that, that one month rental um, it, you know, payment an issue. And uh, if that leads to an eviction, then it's the compounding. Once they've been evicted once, it's harder for them to get stable housing and, and that. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's just used like that. It's also, you know, looking at things like the tenant right to counsel with eviction cases. Um, you know, looking at the issue of trying to, to balance tenants' rights with landlord rights, and especially when they get into that eviction process, those scales aren't balanced. Um, and, and so if you are looking at eviction as uh, chronic eviction and what that means for your housing, house, housing stability and that strategy, preventing those evictions in the first place is a big and, and important yeah. first step. Uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, we, we see examples of this all over the country. Um, as I said, you know, those scales aren't balanced. Landlords, about 90% of your landlords go into a, an eviction process with lawyers, about 10% of your tenants do. So who has, you know, who, who has, you know, I, I don't want to say the power, but it is, you know, who has the ability to negotiate something that may be much more tenable to both parties and certainly to the city as a whole to prevent that. And if you look at, uh, you know, if the city were to, uh, you know, institute this and achieve even just a 60% reduction, looking at, the, looking at the 1,000 evictions in 2016, uh, you know, if you just reduce that by 60%, which some of the best, you know, some of the kind of the best practices around the country and case studies we're seeing say that that's pretty reasonable, 60% reduction in evictions. You're talking about 600 fewer in a year. Uh, so again, just an important piece. Uh, you know, another component of, of this strategy is, is um, kind of the aging in place. You know, our population is getting older. Um, people want to stay in their homes. They want to stay in their neighborhoods. So how can you support that? Um, you know, there's a variety of pieces, you know, to this, com you know, complex issue, too. It's, it's programs and resources in place to rehab homes and make them safe and make them accessible to the, to the, to the elderly and senior homeowners that might already live there. But also, where do you build in infill housing that is accessible to seniors, affordable to seniors? And, uh, you know, one example is the senior village model of just, you know, where you start to see the housing with the services all coming together, um, you know, in, in a way that supports seniors, uh, supports their kind of their continued socialization in, into their neighborhood and into their community, but also provides that housing component for them. Uh, I'm going to breeze through four and five, not to say that these aren't important, but but that the, these issues are, are, you know, we're really again kind of looking at the diversity of housing types how do you promote <coughs> new different types of housing um, market rate housing downtown and 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 uh, that sort of uh, strategy we're also again kind of as i said talking about the intersection um, and and of housing and economic development making sure that housing is uh, you know accessible to well paying jobs education opportunities has the transportation supports Transportation and housing come together to really impact affordability. And so um, while we aren't going to be talking about transportation strategies per se, just understanding how those might be leveraged from the city's perspective is important. And then finally, the last thing I just want to touch on is, is really, again, kind of what we're calling this, this housing ecosystem and expanding the financial and organizational capacity of, um, you know, of, of the city to, to address housing. Uh, a couple of different ways, you know, that we're that we're talking about that uh, strategic land control. I'm um, talking about land banking, targeting incentives, and then building up the community development ecosystem and creating a more robust system so that you've got the partners that, as you increase those resources and target those resources, you've got partners to bear on that. So the land bank, uh, you know, the land bank is as as kind of a, a strategy within this, um, you know, is you know, how do you establish that within the city? Um, the city doesn't have to necessarily be the, the only entity that is um, acquiring and, and purchasing the, you know, uh, the, the land. Um, 
you know, depending on state legislation and enabling legislation, uh, other communities have authorities and commissions that sort of sit you know, quasi-governmental that sit there, you know, the city's directing the policy, but these tools are provided by these other entities. And then those other entities are working hand in hand with community development corporations and CDFIs and, and bringing people together, again, kind of in that targeted, we're gonna do this in a particular area, we're gonna step in as a city, provide, you know, targeted acquisition, cleaning title, and then handing those resources over to people who actually develop, so the city doesn't have to. Uh, targeting incentives. You know, this is, uh, you know, an example here of, of, you know, continuing to leverage your tax rebate program, um, funding the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and, and what you do is, is you're developing a, 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 you know, a pool, a pot of money, you know, and, and, and using that money in very targeted ways um, and, and in targeted, targeted incentives, again, to, to address those gaps in feasibility that we've been talking about. Um, just an example here on the sidebar, you know, if there's an investment of $150,000 per unit um, and, 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 you know, we saw in the feasibility that there is a gap there, <coughs> perhaps the trust fund contributes $25,000 per unit, um, you know, and leverages the, the funds, as you can see there, from a one to six, you know, a, a one to six leveraging ratio. You could impact, you know, the development of 80 units with just a $2 million affordable housing trust fund. And I say just a, but that's, I mean, when you think about the scale that I started you all with in the presentation this evening, a $2 million trust fund impacting 80 units on a, on a rolling basis begins to chip away at that, at, at that scale that we were talking about. And then finally, uh, you know, just to, to kind of, I guess, yeah, emphasize the theme, you know, of, of that ecosystem of really understanding who are all the partners that come, come into play and how can the city support the development of those partners? And one of the things that we've been talking about is, you know, perhaps the role of your uh, neighborhood improvement associations could change. Perhaps rather than what they're doing now, they could, that, you know, with, with, with training and capacity building from the city with using some of the city's resources for that, perhaps you could see them taking a more active role in actual housing stability, housing stabilization. Um, you know, there, it's possible perhaps that NIAs with the, with the right kind of resources in the right locations with other partners at the table could become community development corporations themselves for those neighborhoods and in those areas. It's, it's ideas like that um, and, you know, partnering with other, you know, with LISC and other similar, you know, organizations that do the capacity building for that that you can begin to see, hey, maybe we've got some resources here. Maybe if we just think about them differently, think about them in a way that we haven't over the last 10, 15, 20 years that we might actually be in, you know, be able to impact um, this big issue. I believe that that is my last one. Um, so I'd like to invite Andy to uh, come up and just join me and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your presentation. Councilman Duncan. So in a few seconds, you're going to be able to easily surmise what shows are clogging up my DVR currently at home. <laughs> but I have a tiny homes question, or whatever you want to call those equivalent. And I get to ask this question quite often. Currently, I think we'd have to have some discussions and some policy changes if we thought we wanted those in the city. But I am curious if this study will take any look at whether that's a component we should or shouldn't have in this market, whether that should be part of it, and then if the answer is yes. What if there's any parameters that would be recommended with that suggestion? So I'm just curious about if that component's even part of this study. It has not come up yet um, as a, a, with our work. <coughs> excuse me, to date here in in Topeka, we haven't seen a too many models um, kind of done at scale in communities yet. So if it is something that you want us to consider, we certainly can. It could be could be part of the toolbox, but we are looking for those best practices that that do work. Councilman Lesser to be followed by Councilwoman Nager. Um, I think Spencer asked a good question um, in regards to looking at different options, because quite frankly, in here, I don't see anything you're telling us that we don't already know. Um, are, is there going to be a point in time where there's actual recommendations of this area, this area, this area, um, evaluating something like a tiny homes, 
you know project because like I said I, I don't I don't see anything in here that doesn't tell me anything I didn't already know before so I'm curious are you looking at the at the housing analysis the the market analysis is that I mean so you know what we're, we're, we're in that strategy phase or if you're just talking about the strategies in general I, I you know I um, well, we know we need code enforcement. Um, right. uh, I think weather reservation is great. I don't know how that's. I don't know, necessarily know that that's going to solve, you know, a lack of affordable housing. I'm, I, I, I'm just. I'm, like I said, I I don't see what you're telling me anything I don't already know. Okay. Councilwoman Nager. I am curious, one of the things that comes up a lot whenever I talk to the community, the neighborhoods in my um, area of town are we have some very strong neighborhoods with good NIAs, with good NAs. And one of the things that comes up repeatedly is feeling like they're um, risking their investment of a single family household with rental units and multifamily units, yet we know that we need to have more multifamily units and rental units and doing it developing in these um, strong neighborhoods already would be a great could be a great partnership how do you get neighborhoods to buy in to feel like that's a smart investment for them yeah I, I think the first answer to that is that um, you know we understand that that development needs to happen in a very context sensitive way and so if it's um, and, and by that I guess I mean you know we would not necessarily promote um, you know, townhouses for how, you know, a sixplex or a row townhouses in the middle of a single family kind of neighborhood, not in the middle of it. But if there were, um, you know, already neighborhoods that had, you know, kind of neighborhood service corridor, you know, nodes um, that you could say, well, just maybe outside of that commercial neighborhood service commercial area, you might want to have just a little bit more density to support that commercial that might be there and act as a buffer between that commercial and neighborhood, you know, single family neighborhoods, um, you know, or along corridors, you know, commercial corridors. And, and you know, if, if you're seeing, you know, a lot of historical commercial corridors we're finding in other communities can't support you know, the same level of commercial, you know, along those corridors. So if you start, you know, targeting the, 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 the commercial investment along those nodes, what do you infill that with? You could infill it with housing. So I think some of the conversation, Councilwoman, is just understanding that it, that the different types are, need to be context sensitive and would be in different areas. Um, if, if there's still push, I mean, we understand that there's still pushback to, to density and not understanding. I think that's a lot of that is just helping people understand, you know, what we, we might only be talking about a fourplex. We might only be talking two stories, you know, um, and, and helping them understand because when you talk about apartments, when you say the word multifamily, the density ratio goes up a lot higher than a lot of times, I think, the, the, the developers or, or whatever are talking about. And certainly as we're talking about it, you know, it's, it's really easy for people to go one direction, and I think it's just education about location and type and, and what we're talking about. And Andy, I don't know if you got, or Councilman, go ahead. I, oh, and I was just going to build upon um, Councilman Lether Lesser's <coughs> ideas um, and question. It says that we still have stages to go with working with you guys. Mm -hmm. In some of those stages, are we going to see some of those context-specific solutions introduced where we are going to go more into detail with those solutions or are we still going to be getting more broad um, ideas and then we're going it's to us to go ahead and develop that into contact specific solutions in the uh, course of the study we've yeah. identified a few different focus right. areas that represent kind of the economic cycle That's that different neighborhoods are currently in mm -hmm. And um, it's in the, the full analysis and will be in the report. And these different cycles, you know, there's some, some neighborhoods with a lot of challenges. Um, normally we, we, we describe those as being neighborhoods that need a long-term commitment of community development mm -hmm. efforts. It's going to be 10, 15, 20 years of sustained um, effort. There's also strong, stable neighborhoods that, you know, don't have a lot of you know, specific housing challenges. And each of those contexts needs a different level 
of, of tools applied, and I'm saying that to, to say yes, we're going to address it, you know, what tools and best practices can be applied in the, in the different neighborhood cycles and different focus areas in the city. Deputy Mayor Emerson? Oh, no, I, was, I, I didn't have anything to oh. do Well, thank you, though. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I addressed a few issues. First of all, I think that the fact that now we have an understanding of what the gap is between what a house is being built for and what a developer can actually sell it for is extremely important for us to know. I don't think that we had those numbers. And it's really helpful as we're trying to figure out where to put some additional investment for us to have that. Um, as somebody that worked in low income and affordable housing, I can tell you that it's extremely important for us to talk about weatherization. Because weatherization could be the difference between an individual being able to pay their mortgage or their rent and being able to pay uh, a, a five or a $600 utility bill. And, and it's incredible when you have so many houses in, for example, Central Topeka, that have great houses that are low income, but they're low income and they're not weatherized, you can't move them and you can't make them work for families. Um, I'm excited to see that we're talking about the land banking. That's been something that we have been talking about for a while. And I think that there has been hesitation, but for a municipality that is being restricted by the state with regards to what we can do to mitigate some of the housing issues that we have in our community, a land bank is a very viable alternative for us to say, let's take possession of this house, put it into the land bank, eliminate every single thing that's there so that we could then move this property and make it a property that we, that we can actually sell, or not even sell. We could do what we've been doing with Habitat and with Cornerstone. We've been transferring these lots over to Cornerstone and Habitat, and they've been able to put houses that are houses that are affordable to families and are providing a tax revenue for our community. Because these houses are being built by nonprofits, but they're not, the houses are not nonprofits. Um, so, so there was a lot of stuff here, and, and my last remark before I go to, go to Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala is the fact that there is absolutely the need for the Housing Trust Fund. Uh, you said two million, I would love to see five, and I would love to see it as, as an endowment so that we could keep on pulling from that and have those interest dollars come back to in, into our community. So there is a lot of information that was already known, but I think that there's a little bit more meat that help us now navigate with some solid information where we're going to go and how we're going to tackle these things. So, Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm not sure how many of, of these types of studies we've had over the years being a new council person. Um, I did go over this in the binder, but I also went over a number of times a 44 page one uh, that is that all part of, is that not part of this? the 44-page uh, study that, that gave economic <laughs> information in it. Was that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the market analysis chapters that go along from the website? Yeah, like I'm looking at cost burden yes, by that, neighborhood. Yes, I mean, that's part of this. Those are chapters that would okay. be part of the So that's, that's, that's what I went through. Mm -hmm. And because I'm always about wanting to put more of a human face on what it is that we're dealing with, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that I read in, in the analysis, I'm assuming that you guys put this forth, mm -hmm. is that, you know, here in Topeka, the medium household income is $50,100. Minority populations are in concentrated older areas that historically were prone to redlining when it came to lending and are still suffering from those historic economic impacts and lending uh, choices or lack of lending. African American median income is 30,500 a year while citywide median is $46,100. More than one half of the new jobs that will be created will, be, will pay below 35,000 a year. And studies show that even at $16 an hour, the base amount of renting a two-bedroom in safe and decent quality barely covers the rental costs. In addition to this, there's what they y'all are referring to as cost burdens. And cost burdens are where you're spending 50% <coughs> of income to attempt to cover the cost of your housing. And in 2017, 
22% of the renters in the city of Topeka are severely cost burdened. Mm -hmm. This strain is experienced by renters households is intensified in neighborhoods like East Topeka, 31%, Central Topeka, 25%, North Topeka, 20%, and High Crest at 18%. I wish, even though I know that we have time constraints that some of this information could have put in, it's important that people that are watching understand some of this and know that they can go to the city website and look at this 44-page study because what we are looking at is systemic issues across the board. We can talk housing and ways to do this, but we have to look at deeper issues as well, such as economic inequality, low-paying jobs, redlining that no longer occurs, but we are still reeling from what happened during that time when loans were not given, when they were qualified to be given. So what we're looking at, again, I believe is systemic issues, and I don't know what all organizations partner with us to, to look at this, um, but looking at these neighborhoods, I sure hope as a city we develop the backbone to do it because these neighborhoods are continuing, even, those are, even though there's little pockets of, of hope that you can see, these neighborhoods are de uh, continuing to decline. And I think we're just looking at a, a ticking, you know, problem here. If, and, and, and do we have the will to do it? And how many studies have we had like this in the past? That's not a question for you. Mm -hmm. That's probably a rhetorical question in nature. So, city manager. I can actually answer. It was 1990 when the last housing study was done, and it was only on affordable housing, not the whole community needs. Mm -hmm. So it's been 30 years since we looked at anything related to housing assessment. Wow. Thank, thank you. Thank, th thank you for your comments. I just want to say we had a 97 slide, is it 97, 87 slide presentation mm -hmm. that we're going to be doing with the steering committee and, and, and the market. And, and a lot of that analysis was actually stuff that we presented to the steering committee and the stakeholders at our last trip. And uh, yeah, you can imagine kind of the, 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 that perspective and all of that data and then the market analysis and then the strategies just continue to, 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 to paint that picture. And you'll be seeing that all, you know, represented in the report. I appreciate you bringing that up, though. Councilman Duncan to be followed by Deputy Mayor. There we go. So uh, you're not policymakers, so I'm not asking this through that prism of you, for you folks. It's our job to take your recommendations and figure out how we're going to make them work. But obviously, the largest component of that is what everybody's problem is money, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious if this report will have any suggestions, recommendations, or examples of tools other communities have put in place to help fund their trust fund or its incentives that have been successful to help create those mixed use or infill developments, if that's any part of this report by the time it's done? The short answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean, that's, and so it's, it's, it's looking at best practices. It's looking at what other, other communities have done, talking to, you know, the, the city and understanding your, your context and what's feasible and not. I mean, it doesn't mean that something that may not be immediately politically feasible won't hit the report. It probably will hit the report. And then, like you said, it's just a matter of policy and politics of, of what gets put into play. But as far as what, what that looks like and how we set up some of those key uh, strategies that, that I highlighted tonight, you'll, you'll see that. Mm -hmm. Deputy Mayor, to be followed by Councilman Adobra. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, you may have noticed, Mr. Carney, when you were doing the presentation, some of us were kind of talking here. and. Um, just as a clarification, mm -hmm. your slides don't match the presentation we have in our, um, I think even some of the numbers are different. So I'm not sure if we have the correct version or if what you showed us tonight was the correct version. But so what you saw tonight is the correct version and we'll okay. make sure you have an updated okay. presentation. Th that'd be fantastic. And, and just kind of just a comment, <coughs> I, I joined my colleagues that have asked, I, I would love at the end of this for there to be some very specific um, recommendations that you guys make, concrete steps we can take. Mm -hmm. um, just because over the years, um, as, a, as a councilwoman kind of alluded, we've had study after study after study after study, and it sits on a shelf because there's no concrete steps to take. And uh, I think everybody kind of gets tired of that after a while. So uh, I know I do. So I would love to see concrete steps that we can start taking uh, 
like next month or whenever the thing's finished, let's, mm -hmm. let's get started. So thank you. Thank you. Councilman Dobler. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. Follow up on Councilman uh, <laughs> Henderson. Henderson. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, let's let's get this down to three things or five things that we can do. And I guess I'm not directing that to you. It's more to staff. We we can't do 20 things. We can't do 30 things. Let's get five things that we can do. Figure out what they are. Figure out how to fund them and and get them done. Exactly what uh, you said. Thank. you. Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I was part of the 1991. We really haven't done a lot of housing plans, and at that time we weren't doing anything, so it was really easy for them to make some specific recommendations, and we tried all of them, I think, with some success and some not. Um, I'm, I'm excited about the analysis of the cost and the numbers of who needs what. I think that's a good base for us to start from, from the housing. I, I'm in, inclined to, it, I, I guess you gave us fair warning, but the options are fairly boilerplate at this point. Um, would you say that at this juncture, you know, you're pretty familiar with what we're already doing, both the city as well as the services otherwise in the community? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Because, for instance, we have weatherization programs, we have oh, yeah. rehab programs, we have tenant landlord counseling programs and financial, and, and um, we've been pretty successfully land banking already when there was a targeted need. Um, and so I yeah, so so when you see that you, like it's expand weatherization, continue code enforcement. Well, it, so like you know, we're, we're recognizing it in, that. in a gen generic way, but okay. we we're doing enough mm -hmm. that that is is complex and could be a little misleading or dis I don't know cause some disruption to kind of unless you're really knowledgeable about what we have. Is there a chance that your recommendations would would simply say you've got this you identified it as six point nine million and we think you should do this with it instead of what you're doing now? I mean is there a mm -hmm. upset the fruit basket possibility? Uh, it It'd probably be a little more nuanced than that. I mean, I think I think with with the conversations that we've had with staff and understanding what is being used for that six six point nine million, um, you know, it, I, I don't imagine we'll say scrap everything you're currently doing and do something different with it. I think there's probably yeah, no, I was an option. Yeah, I, I guess it is an option. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's I think that'd be a conversation for us to for you all to have to say if you're not doing that then what are you know you, like as you said you know councilwoman you are doing the city is doing certain things with those funds mm -hmm. um you know i guess if there were that sort of a recommendation it would also need to recognize what doesn't get done then that you have been doing that has been successful well and so i mean i think right and so i think but your analysis might be that there are certain things we've been doing that weren't very successful yeah and so i don't I don't know. That's yeah. more than today, mm -hmm. but at this point, because we've been doing things for whatever it is, almost 30 years, um, and there's public housing that is doing a lot, and Habitat, and it's Community Action that does a lot of the weatherization. They're not part of the city; they're a partner, mm -hmm. and right. so just just kind of checking. Yeah. Um, much more to talk about on that. Specifically for me, um, I wish that somebody could give us a. a some examples or a comprehensive suggestion, particularly about how to be successful doing infill. That's a priority of our comprehensive land use plan. We have lots all over town. Many of them are vacant now, most in private ownership, some publicly owned. Um, but I think we haven't come up with, you know, if, if we had a comprehensive strategy on how to attract that infill development, we might not need to own it. We might not need to do as much work as we're talk, as considering doing now if, if we could make it attractive. And so I, if there's anything you can provide us yeah. in, in that broader sense on just an infill strategy, I would sure appreciate strategy. it. You bet. Yeah, and, and, and I think when I started off saying, you know, this is that, this is you're sort of setting that table on all of these possible strategies and that we'll be spending, you know, four hours tomorrow with the steering committee and other stakeholders and then more time with the staff to, and so putting that on the list Appreciate is it. definitely stuff we can do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Seeing no additional <coughs> comments or questions, we do have somebody signed up for public comment. 
Uh, thank you for your All presentation. Right. Thank you. Um, we'll see you at the next trip. That individual signed up is Mr. Joseph Ledbetter. I uh, have sent some of my commentary to them. I didn't see any of it showing up in their uh, comments uh, over the last few months. But I could agree more with Neil about boil it down to three things and let's do it and move on. Maybe five, but you know, <clears throat> really great leaders will tell their subordinates, you put it on one page or I'm not reading it. And, and get to the point, and I don't want your study, I don't want your uh, footnotes, I want you to give me rock solid analysis. And if you're a leader, you'll do that and you'll be a problem solver. And if you're not, you're in the wrong job. Uh, either solve the problem or move on. Um, housing's been a problem, number one, and I've said it ever since 2015 to start over at Highcrest, was enforce the codes. And you'll still see pockets where it's not being done. And you'll see one neighborhood will get a really good inspector for a while and then uh, they move them or whatever and then uh, the same lazy people are back to doing the same stuff and they're just ruining a neighborhood. It only takes one house to destroy a block. And I don't think people sometimes in code enforcement and management really understand that because unless you live there, you don't get it. Uh, it can be very harmful to property values to have one slumlord, uh, even within two or three blocks of you, uh, not uh, you know, following the codes, uh, being a predator landlord that won't fix furnaces, uh, these people are out in the cold, I understand about the weatherization, but we've had it for 30 years. I've seen houses torn down where they weatherized them the year before. And so where did all that money go? It just went up in smoke. So I don't know that even all those programs are run all that well, but you know, I'm, I'm sure they benefited somebody for a little while, and that's good. Uh, but if we don't enforce the codes, we've got nothing. This, this housing study, you can spend another 100000 in five years and then 100000 in 10 years until we focus on that and, and everybody in the court system and the prosecutor's office gets it that this is a serious issue in Topeka, uh, you're, you're just wasting money. The second thing that we are not addressing in housing, in my opinion, in this community is the need for new housing. Uh, we could be building new uh, duplexes. People could be buying, you know, one side, that kind of thing. Those are very popular in a lot of cities. Uh, you can do them probably in many areas in this city that it's already, you know, would already be conducive to that. I don't see enough of that. Uh, I don't see any uh, vision out of the city to grow the population. I'm talking about management. I, I just don't see it. I don't hear it. Uh, we've lost 5,000 people over the last... Uh, seven years, and I don't, I don't see any programs to uh, deter that or stop it, other than the private sector is doing things. Go to Peak is trying to do things, but I don't see anything out of the city. Uh, so one of the ideas I passed along, and I didn't see it in here, was I said, why don't you give these builders a free water meter? What is it, $2,000, $2,500? It's nothing. We have ridiculously high reserves in our utilities right now. And they continue to keep saying, we're going to keep doing it. They don't listen to people like me come down and say, you should be at 15%. They don't want to hear it. And we'll get into that about budgets. I'll keep repeating it. But that's what they teach us at KU in the master's program. I wish I, I, wish I could talk to somebody uh, that has one of those. Oh, Neil does. Uh, so, uh, you know, they actually teach you how to run a city well. But we could be giving away these water meters and actually building new houses in this community, in my opinion. Uh, Mr. Lebetter, do you need additional time? Well, sure. I mean, maybe they'll take some of these ideas and put them in a report. That'd be good. Uh, could I have two minutes? We have a two-minute extension. I'll wrap this up. By Councilwoman Ortiz. Do we have a second? Okay. We have a second by Councilman Emerson. We proceed by voting. You have 10 yes. You have two more minutes. <clears throat> I miss Miss Clear. <laughs> no, that's, 
It's a joke. <laughs> for those of you who weren't here before. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that, that I did not see mentioned is just beautification. <laughs> beautification of neighborhoods. And you know what? You need to involve Parks and Rec in that because Parks and Rec took over some of those parcels and they did not maintain them. Now, I want them to maintain them. I'm on that advisory and I hound them about it and they're starting to do some of them. But neighborhood parks and uh, these little parcels that used to have flowers and things like that, like you see in Potwin, those should be maintained. That's supposed to be done by Parks and Rec. Uh, we could be doing that and it actually uh, adds value to a neighborhood when you see new playground equipment. People will buy into a neighborhood that they have kids if they see that kind of stuff. They, they're attracted to it. I'll tell you something else we need, and I've, I've brought this up before, and I don't know if we'll ever get it done. We need to get it done. But the east side needs another entry exit way uh, on the Kansas Turnpike. And what that would do, and I've, I've talked to some people that actually commute to Lawrence and commute to Kansas City that would like to live on the east side and have nicer houses over in Shawnee Heights, like uh, Aquarian Acres and... Uh, your area out there, uh, Mr. Emerson, but they want a better connection to the highways or they're not going to do it. I actually know one family would do that. They would, they would build right now if there was a entryway on the east side where they could get on and off the turnpike because uh, the wife works in a well-paid job in Lawrence. Now, they're going to stay in Topeka, I hope, but they want that ability to to put a house over on that side of town. And, and we have neglected that side of town with uh, a highway entries and exits for years. Planning's been out of the loop. Uh, we just have not done visionary things in this community that actually would grow the city. Uh, I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ledbetter. We now move on to item B, if the clerk would read. B is discussion for the purpose of establishing priorities for the 2021 budget on or before the third Tuesday of May and discussion of grant priorities. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. So as we move forward, it's a discussion now related to our priorities related to the budget. And Nick Hawkins will go through the information, the presentation that he laid on your table, that he will go through highlighting mm -hmm. Key components of the budget. Nick? <laughs> All right, well, good evening, uh, members of the governing body. Um, so, I might wait just a minute. Yeah. Room clear out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, Tonight is the unofficial uh, opening of the 2021 budget process. Um, and so tonight I'm going to be walking through uh, the 2020 budget priorities that were passed by council last April. Um, I'm gonna highlight some of our resident engagement efforts in preparation for the 2021 budget. And then we're gonna look at next steps and tentative calendar dates for the 2021 budget. So first, um, a review of the 2020 budget priorities. Um, as mentioned in the opening, budget priorities are required by code to be adopted no later than the third Tuesday in May. Um, that is to give uh, city staff time to uh, develop a proposed budget that addresses the priorities um, passed by the governing body. In reality, we typically come back in April to adopt these priorities because that just gives us extra time to try and implement that into the proposed budget. So there are five priorities, which I'm gonna give a, a brief highlight of. In your packet, you have the, the full list of uh, priorities and objectives. Um, so I'm gonna start with improving fiscal sustainability in governments. <coughs> Uh, some of the highlighted objectives are, um, as we've talked already a little bit about today, uh, establish and maintain adequate reserves for all funds. Um, I say for most of the funds that we actually have uh, requirements on, we are at that required level. So for instance, the general fund, um, we have a 15% fund balance requirement, 20% uh, goal. And right now we are um, at that level. 
uh, build a comprehensive plan to address facilities and fleet uh, deferred maintenance. Um, so in the last several years, um, some things that we have done at the end of 2016, the governing body um, through the excess funds resolution that we uh, put together um, set aside funds for fleet. Um, in 20, the 2019 budget, uh, we actually established a, a fleet maintenance program um, where we were able to get uh, at least, I think, believe four departments to um, um, go into that program. Um, but as we also talked about during the CIP discussion, that requires a lot of capital to get that program started, and so we're still trying to look to expand that. Um, and then continue to ele elevate adequate funding level for utility operations and capital needs. And some of that was addressed through the, the rate increases that were recently passed, and that's being addressed through our, our CIP process right now. Second uh, is a, a commitment to continuing uh, public safety efforts. Uh, so first, uh, continue active and strenuous recruitment of police officers and firefighters to maintain an optimal level of officers and firefighters. Um, second is to continue working with uh, community partners to implement mental health uh, programming, including the alternative sentencing court, and then continue to promote and develop uh, public education and awareness campaigns through neighborhood public re presentations and social media. Uh, next is a, a commitment to uh, developing neighborhoods. Um, so continue engaging with neighborhoods to solicit and develop unique solutions to neighborhood specific issues. I think a couple of examples of that have been highlighted through our Team Up to Clean Up um, program, which highlights um, specific neighborhoods each year to go in and, and target uh, different areas for improvement there. Uh, police Chief um, tonight already talked about some of the community policing efforts that are going on. Um, continue focus on identifying, category, categorizing, and addressing substandard and vacant properties and affordable housing solutions. Again, we just talked about that. Um, selected strategic investments towards quality of life. Uh, one of the more recent objectives that was uh, input was considering public health impact in the budget decision making process. I think that one gets addressed through a lot of the, the objectives that are already in, in included in here and that we've talked about um, already. And then continuing to evaluate uh, appropriate levels of support for various quality of life endeavors, including uh, youth employment, uh, uh, Topeka Performing Arts Center, our social service agencies, Visit Topeka, Downtown, Riverfront. Um, the 2020 budget kept, I believe, most of those programs at the same funding level as they had been in, in previous years. And then finally, we have investing in infrastructure. Um, so continuing as, as, I think there's a lot of overlap in between this one and, and our fiscal sustainability, but continuing to evaluate adequate funding level for our utility capital needs. Again, we're addressing that um, through rate studies and capital improvement programs. Um, one that's been talked about a lot, investing funding from multiple sources to address street maintenance and strive for a pavement condition index of at least 60 with the goal of 70. Um, that one was implemented about three years ago, um, and we were able to get additional funding into the general fund um, to pay for some of those street needs. Um, and uh, through uh, the capital improvement program, uh, updating the, the cap for those first three years to address some, some street needs as well. Um, so. Right now, I think we are on track to get uh, at or close to that level by 2027, which was the initial goal. And then, as always, establishing long-term comprehensive solutions for all city infrastructure, including streets, utilities, facilities, and alleys. So when we look at 2021 budget challenges, and this is something that I sometimes feel like a broken record, but we highlight this every year. Uh, one is expenditure growth versus revenue growth. Um, looking at the general fund over the last couple of years, we've seen increases of between one half and one percent, um, which when you're looking at real dollars, that's about $500,000 and million dollars at best that we're seeing growth from a revenue standpoint um, in our main operating fund. Um, over the last couple of years, we've had to um, address annual operating <coughs> deficits. Uh, I believe we talked in the third quarter last year about um, putting in a purchasing freeze, and that helped. Um, so 
barring just a, a disastrous December sales tax, which we're not anticipating, um, we will be balanced in the general fund for 2019. Um, but it's a, it's an ongoing um, piece as we'll probably need to address some of that this year as well. Even though we addressed the 2020, when we put together the 2020 budget, we had a good idea of what some of those challenges are and hopefully they're not um, as severe as we've had to address in the past, but um, it's a continuing issue that we're, we're facing in our, in our annual operating budget um, is addressing those needs. Um, third is reliance on economically sensitive revenues. So roughly half or even a little bit more than half of the revenues coming into our general fund are what we would categorize as economically sensitive. So sales tax, um, uh, franchise fees on uh, electric and gas and cable bills, these are revenues that are dependent on things like uh, weather patterns or um, how the economy in the city is, is doing. Um, so if the economy is down, more than likely sales tax collections are going to come in lower. Um, if we have really mild winters and summers, then we're not going to be getting as much revenue from those electric and gas franchise fees. Um, and the franchise fees in particular are ones that are really hard to project because you don't know what the weather's going to do on a, on a regular basis. Um, all of those things have impact on our levels of service. And again, I would say the last several years, we've had to make adjustments um, in our budget uh, to make sure that uh, we're coming in balanced because that's the appropriate um, thing to do. And when we look ahead to the 2021 budget, we don't see those issues going away. So if revenue is going like this and expenditures are going like this, we have to make adjustments on the expenditure side um, to do it. Really, we have two options. You either increase revenues or you decrease expenditures. And um, at least the last several years, we've looked primarily on the expenditure level. <coughs> So every year we try and expand um, what we do with our resident engagement. In the last several years we've had a lot of one-off discussions. Um, we've had big events at the library and invited citizen residents to come in and uh, learn about their city budget. Uh, we've had budget hearings, um, which have been kind of more formal options where we present on the budget and then have residents come up and talk about um, what they want to see in the budget. This year, um, we're doing a more intensive effort, um, partnering with our neighborhood relations uh, department partners to go out to neighborhoods and present on the budget. Um, talk about um, and the basics of a city budget, um, the challenges which I just, uh, which I just highlighted here um, that we face when we're trying to put together a budget that addresses all the council priorities. Um, and I think through this effort, we'll get to a more granular level versus having those one-off events that you might get 20 people to um, at best. We had a, a, our, our first resident engagement effort last Wednesday um, with the CAC, and that alone brought in 20 people, neighborhood leaders, um, and I think it was, it was met with uh, positive results. Um, the, the presentation that we give is um, one that I've, I've actually done with a, a resident <coughs> engagement university when I was in Kansas City. Um, it's interactive. It has a budget game that um, puts residents in your shoes and our shoes and um, asks them to put together a budget. If you had $100, how would you put together your general fund budget? And we have some education pieces before that as well. Um, again, we highlight uh, key budget challenges that the city faces and um, input that we receive from that. Uh, helps um, put together the uh, the budget priorities for the year as well because we're hearing from residents what they want to see um, in the in the operating budget. So, looking at uh, next steps for 2021, these are a uh, few key dates, and I'll um, note that our discussion on the CIP that was scheduled for tonight did get moved uh, uh, to next week. So we will be discussing the capital improvement plan next week. Um, and throughout the month of March um, with the hopes of adopting that in early April. Uh, again, talking about budget priorities, um, while the, the date that we have to have those in by is the, the third week in May, the earlier we can get that in and get that feedback incorporated, uh, the better the budget process will go. Um, throughout April and, and May, we're really developing that operating budget, and the last piece of that is when we get our assessed valuations from the county by June 15th. 
Um, and that's really kind of the, the bow that we put on the budget and incorporate that and put together our budget book and then get it out to council and we start our, our workshops where we highlight individual funds and, and challenges that we, we had putting together the budget. Um, all throughout this time, we will be continuing our resident engagement efforts. And if there are any groups that um, um, you would like for us to highlight and go out and make sure that we're meeting with, we'll certainly um, try and make that work through our, our relationship with the, the Neighborhood Relations Department, who's been great partners in this effort. Um, we have uh, uh, budget workshops planned for the latter part of June. And then when you get into July, that's when we're starting to make the concrete um, budget decisions, seeing if there are any amendments needed, um, setting our maximum taxes levied. And then August is more of the procedural. We have to do a public hearing um, and adopt the budget by April or August 25th um, per, the, uh, per state law. So next steps from here. Um, Welcome any uh, feedback that you have on these existing priorities. Um, if you like the priorities and objectives in here, we don't have to make any changes. But if there are um, objectives that you would like to see uh, incorporated into the budget, um, then we can we can come back and certainly have additional conversations on um, what could be added there. Um, if not, our, our next step would be adopting the priorities at the April 7th council meeting. And again, that's um, per the code. We have to do that by the third week in May. So with that, I will open it up for any questions. Deputy Mayor. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't know, uh, Mr. Hawkins, if it's a question for you or the city manager, but we're going to discuss the CIAP next week. I think there's still some pieces of that we're missing. Is that correct? Yeah. So we um, we've been working with departments to gather responses and um, uh, with the hope that we can get something out um, tomorrow or Thursday at the latest, so you have time to review that. But next week we'll be going over um, uh, questions and responses that we've received um, to that. But again, the CIP is an ongoing process, so. Um, so I guess just to clarify, you're going to give it to us Thursday, then you want us to submit questions to you to answer on Tuesday. Is that correct? Um, these would be questions that uh, have come up um, during the workshop and yeah. in subsequent uh, okay. days. Okay. Um, it's the questions that we're already aware of. Yes. If you have additional items that you've okay. from studying, we would like to have them, and we'll try to do the best we can to get it to you. But and this really is addressing what was discussed. At the, at the workshop day and trying to prepare that to be able to review. Okay, thank you. Councilwoman Nager? Oh, sorry. Councilwoman Ortiz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I see on here that you had neighborhood group presentations, so you're thinking like NIAs. Is that what you're thinking about? Well, we were able to address most of the NIA leaders at the CAC meeting, mm -hmm. and they were actually invited um, to that meeting. Um, if there are other groups, uh, a lot of the ones that we've uh, uh, reached out to have been specific ones. I think um, um, like your Sertoma clubs, Rotary clubs, um, and then also I, I believe, and um, I'll confirm this um, uh, tomorrow, but I think we have two open dates already set up and we'll look to continue um, when we can find those opportunities to, to set those opportunities up for just general uh, discussion as well but if you have specific groups that, that you're thinking of uh, we'll try and take those into well account. and those groups are all good but it doesn't address the youth and it doesn't address the elderly so I'd like to see how we would implement them um, you know we've, we've got a youth council um, so I, I don't think that would be hard um, however we, we were to do that and um, we got senior citizens that they're not going to come to these meetings not a lot of them they don't drive at night or whatever so I just think that's something that would be beneficial to them that they would have a say. I'm just looking at everybody being covered. The middle people, they can they can fend for themselves. But I always think about the youth and the elderly. Yes, and a, a great point, and I probably should have highlighted that we are reaching out to those groups and trying to find ways that we can get to them um, specifically. So if that's during the day, um, we're carving out time in our schedule to go out and, and reach those <coughs> those groups. Definitely, we have Excuse mentioned me. um, and working with I, I just I didn't see it mentioned yep. so I, that's why I wanted to mention it thank you madam mayor councilwoman Hiller thank you mayor 
I wanted to comment on the budget priority suggestions and then ask a couple questions about the calendar. Um, overall, uh, I think these budget priorities have stood us in pretty good stead in recent years, and um, I'm, I'm interested in input from others, but to me, they look pretty good to simply <clears throat> move forward pretty much as they have been. So, for what that's worth. Um, on the calendar, I have a question and then maybe draw a number of people's attention to some things in here. One, um, I concur with Councilman Emerson. I'm not sure exactly what we're going to get, but we, we won't have it very far in advance of the 18th. I don't see a discussion section for the session for the CIP in March. So I, I think we would probably um, add that at least to probably the first um, the first week, possibly the, the third week in March. But um, if there if there is a need for additional conversation, we'll we'll work to put that. Um, well, if I, uh, if I can, sure. I think for us, it's it's really dependent on the number of questions and issues or changes that you're looking at making in the CIP. I mean, we don't want to put it on the agenda if there aren't issues that need to be discussed. If if there are changes or discussion that you need to have as a group related to I'd like to make this change in what's in the CIP, then then we need to have it on the agenda. And so right now we had a few questions the other day, but we haven't had a lot generated as far as individuals that are saying, I think this project shouldn't be included. Um, I think this project should only be funded at half the amount. And I mean, those are the types of things that we feed off of in order to be able to prepare uh, in implications from that type of change if there's a project that you think needs to be moved forward and I think that's that's the kind of input we need to have in order when we get to that point and we'll have we can have CIP on every agenda in March if necessary in order to get through those discussions well one of the things that and, and you've been in on this but for me I have held off doing my deep dive into it because you all still haven't proposed it's a 10-year plan and we've only been given five years of it and so I'm interested in seeing what you want to do with the second five years so I don't have to do that process twice and I don't want to make tentative decisions that would then be impacted by what you're proposing for the full plan um, I also um, uh, I'm interested in seeing the fourth quarter report because part of my assessment on the CIP is how are we doing on what we already said we were going to do and we've gotten I love the quarterly reports but nonetheless that that fourth quarter financial report shows you which projects were actually set up and which ones actually made progress during the year and for me looking at whether we're able to manage what we've got on the table impacts not just dollars but impacts my suggestions back to you so I don't feel like I have the basics for what your proposal is yet so that I can do my study and ask the questions and so and, and we've had a little communication because I, I need you know all of us have different schedules so I would like to have a hundred percent of what I need to look at at least probably ten days before whenever we're going to do it you know, or longer if you want me to give me a week to look at it and then send you questions so that we get the best optimal use of the time that we are together. And I've just felt like we, we weren't there yet. And I, I feel bad if I have questions that might be pretty meaningful ones that I haven't asked you yet, but I feel like I'm caught. And so I hope that we could maybe look a little more at those internal deadlines. It occurred to me just the other day, and, and I might be wrong, um, that you introduced to us the issue of Paul Quincy Viaduct, but didn't give us an out five years in plan. And so if there's some conversation you're wanting to have with us about what we're going to do about that, I'd like to have it so that we know what you're thinking. And we, we haven't had that yet. So. Just, just for those things, if we can get an internal time frame between next week and April 7th so that um, um, and moving to the next thing, most many of us plan our personal time on the last couple weeks of the month. So I personally have a vacation planned the end of March, so I hope I don't get it on the 29th <laughs> and, and, and with an expectation that I would instantly, in, with a two-day turnaround, do, do what I need to do. Um, along those lines, I'm looking at the calendar for the budget. 
And I see that the workshops and discussion that you have scheduled, I assume for us, are on Saturday, June 20th, Tuesday, and the fourth and fifth Tuesdays in June when we don't have council meetings. Now, I don't know if there was any discussion with folks, but all of those are after our series of three council meetings in June. So just wanted to bring those to people's attention because if, if anybody was not going to be available, it would be a good time to have that conversation. I'm good for that one, but I wasn't for the other. Sure, and that you know, and that's why we bring it to you at, at this meeting because there's still tentative dates at this time, and if there are options that don't work, then we'll look towards other available options. This follows a similar pattern that we've done with um, previous budgets and having the one Saturday workshop where we generally focus on the general fund and, and major changes and then um, have um, one or two um, evening meetings if needed to highlight those other funds in the budget. Um, regarding CIP, I, I believe the city manager um, said it well, you know, obviously as we talked about at the beginning, we want to make sure you're comfortable with the plan. Um, and that's why, you know, in the last couple of years, we've, we, prior to last year, we hadn't started these conversations until March. Right. Um, and so trying to get that out um, and address those, uh, thank you for, for the feedback, and we'll obviously try and um, um, put together a schedule that, that um, helps make it as comfortable as possible. Thank you. I think one other thing I'd like to add regarding the schedule, and it, it is compressed, and this year with the dates the way they fall, related to the timeline that we have regarding when we need to conduct the public hearing and get adoption, it just so happens that we don't end up with our estimated values until the 15th. We are able to have one meeting basically before and, and before after that date before we would need to take it up in July. And so it really has compressed the time schedule when we know what our actual tax amounts are going to be we end up having to have meetings off schedule. So apologize for that, but that's just the way the schedule works out. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, yeah, City Manager, I believe in uh, one of the things we got in our, uh, our legislative update from uh, Mr. Dameron was there's actually a proposal to change the, the budget thing to the end of the year after we know our valuations, correct? Yeah, there are some changes that are proposed that will affect how that, we do business. That would be nice because it's kind of a, I don't know, Trying to think of a better word for it. Come kind of Mickey Mouse way. It's done now. We have to kind of guess, and then yes. you don't know for a few months. So that'd be that'd be great. I hope we're supportive of that. Oh yeah. Thank you. Seeing no additional comments, we do have Mr. Ledbetter signed up to speak on this item. Thank you. First off, I want to. Uh, Share information came up at the last meeting about uh, the newest crater dug in Gage Park. I have one of these for the record and one for every voting member of the governing body. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> I sent one of these to you electronically, and they basically show the number of mature trees, if you look at it carefully, uh, that were torn out of uh, Gage Park. And I am on that advisory, and uh, we had no notification of any of that. Uh, the director uh, who was here last week said he had never been notified, even when he was the assistant director, about that project. <coughs> and we not only have uh, destroyed trees, but we also have been, uh, we need some pedestrian bridges built across the moat that was dug so we can uh, reconnect with Helen Hawker, the zoo, and uh, our shelter house that's been cut off from street parking. So, uh, We'll be discussing that at uh, future advisory council. <clears throat> One of the things that I, I keep hearing about is our projections of sales tax. And I will tell you, your sales tax is going to go down if you don't start growing this population. Uh, every person that leaves this community takes that sales tax with them. And that includes on their utility bills. That includes on their cell phones. Uh, that includes on everything we're paying for at the store. Uh, so when those people leave uh, and this population falls 5,000 like it has the last seven years uh, and the city management directors are not seeming to be able to handle this problem and tell us some new things to do to grow this population, it's going to affect our budgets severely. Now these are my comments and my comments only. 40 was the number. 
But one of the things we were promised two and a half years ago was productivity. Uh, we were promised that we would have productivity, we'd be uh, trimming FTEs, and I'm not talking about police, I'm not talking about fire, and I'm not talking about the zoo. Those are very well-run departments. <laughs> but I remember that discussion when we hired managers. And uh, I have not seen productivity ideas come up uh, because that's what will ultimately save our budgets. Uh, if, if your population is going down, you must uh, trim staff. You must start making uh, uh, better gains in productivity. Productivity is a word that any manager, any management team needs to be highly aware of. Uh, I can go over to this building over here on uh, Jefferson, and I know there's at least three people answering the phone, and I'm going, why can't one person answer the phone for these different sections? I don't get it. But I've watched that for years. I mean, these are just simple things that anybody should be able to walk through and notice and say, hey, why don't we do this differently and let's, uh, you know, let's let some people retire. Let's let some, uh, uh, let's, let's get the numbers down so we have a more manageable budget so we don't have to raise taxes, rates, and fees. Um, <clears throat> we talk about neighborhood engagement. Well, I've been kind of out of that with Highcrest. I just know that Sometimes they complain a lot with these NIAs that they don't feel like they're being listened to. They feel like it's a one-way conversation and it's a talk down to them <coughs> and they're not getting their problems solved in a timely fashion. Again, I don't, I'm not in that uh, for the last two years. Uh, I know one of the biggest complaints I hear in this city is about our streets. Uh, and I don't know why we can't seem to have uh, real testing done as to how you fix these things so that they hold up. Um, I think there's been a little bit of improvement, but I'll tell you what, I still hear it all the time. And I don't know why a person should fix a pothole and it's come undone three or four weeks later. Um, I think I've said plenty tonight, uh, plenty to digest. And uh, I will tell you that. Uh, I hope we we really go deep in these budgets and don't get rushed. That's all. Thank you for your comments. We now proceed to public comment. If the clerk would read. Oh, that's true. Public comment first. Wait. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, public comment. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's idea. Right Mr. Stippleby. I see you smile. It's still so late. <laughs> Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs for the Topeka Justice Unity Ministry Project, and that's 25 church congregations of all different kinds of faith. And we'll be turning out 1,400 people of your constituents <coughs> at the AMI Action Assembly on April 25th at Lee Arena at Washburn University. That's one of the largest gatherings of your constituents that will happen this calendar year. So I invite you to attend that, that Nehemiah Action Assembly. Several of you uh, probably anticipated that we would be here tonight to listen to the housing study. <coughs> because that's what we've been working on for five years, to try to get the community's attention to address the needs of low-income families for safe and affordable housing. A solution to that affordable housing shortage for low-income renters is a no-brainer and should be at, at the top of the list of priorities. Not the only thing on the list, certainly, <coughs> but surely and clearly a priority. And we will be taking that item up at our at Nehemiah Action. That will be on the agenda this year. So specifically, we want public funding, $2 million for the Housing Trust Fund as an incentive for private and nonprofit providers, entities to provide safe and affordable housing for low and moderate income households. The revised Housing Trust Fund you passed last year, that's what that Housing Trust Fund is designed to do. Sure, we do have current programs. That's right. And they're working 
well as best they can with their current funding. But the housing gap is outpacing our current production. We were <coughs> glad to hear from development strategies and we know the recommendations on strategies to address gaps will help Topeka construct and preserve housing at a faster rate than we are doing right now. There will be a strategy for developing high-end housing. We expect that. That is fine. But we also expect that to be met with something for people living in poverty. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your comments. We now move on to announcements, if the clerk would read. Uh, the February 18th agenda, we have two uh, Human Relations Commission appointments. We have one to the Topeka Sustainability Advisory Board. And then non-action items, we have a discussion um, on the CFE. City Manager. Thank you. I have one item that Nick didn't cover that uh, I wanted to cover. I don't know if you know, but Nick has tendered his resignation and will be leaving at the end of the month. And so he has taken a job in North Kansas City as a finance director. So we obviously have some additional uh, stress related to our finance department as we go into the budget process. But we are beginning the process for hiring soon, and uh, we'll fill that position as soon as we can. Have some quality staff persons that are in there. They're new, but uh, they're quality, and we'll pick up and keep moving along as we go. Darn it, Nick. <laughs> you look like you're having so much fun. <laughs> well, I, first I wanted to start by saying thank you to uh, the individuals, especially Deputy Mayor Emerson, who we talked, and after we talked last week, he's like, you shouldn't come. <laughs> you shouldn't come. You sound horrible. I had pneumonia, and I'm still taking antibiotics, so I'm not hacking anymore, uh, but I'm feeling a lot better right now, and just thank you. It's great to know that I have a great team uh, that, that has my back. Um, wanted to congratulate our, our team. We were qualified yet again um, by the Bloomberg Harvard team to send three key individuals of our community back to Harvard to, to receive training on negotiating. Um, we are working on the slate of individuals that we're going to send. They're going to be staff members. It's what they're requesting. It's not governing body opportunities. But they have asked for three staff members that I can choose to send out so that they could get full training on negotiation. Um, because they understand that negotiating skills are some of the hardest things that we have um, to do as part of our job. Um, that's it for me right now, Councilwoman Ortiz. Thank you. Um, City Manager, I'd like to direct you not to take Nick's resignation until after the budget, please. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. Um, uh, I wanted to mention a couple things. Um, East Topeka North had a sort meeting that was turned out to be very good, very, very good. We, there were some new people there um, with the same old questions and why aren't we doing this? So I think they got some of their answers, our questions answered. So um, just just very good feedback. It's never too late to add. If you didn't get there and you and you have more, more to add, you're welcome to do that. <clears throat> And then um, last but not least, I, I wanted to say, um, you know, we had a, a fire on Saturday um, and it was not good and we lost somebody. And again and again, you guys laugh at me, but I'm really serious about getting those smoke detectors to help our guys. Um, this particular fire <clears throat> was at 1200 Collins. And um, I just think, I don't, I don't know, and I don't know if the chief can tell me if they had a smoke detector. It said that they did. Day, but um, if it wasn't working. Um, but um, it, was, it was really sad, you know, when the guys got there and, and they're trying to get a person out and the husband's fighting them and just, just all the chaoticness. But, again, if you don't have a smoke detector, please, if you know somebody that doesn't have one, please get one because it really, really helps our guys before they can get there. Um, they do their best, but it, it happens. Thank you, Mayor. Deputy Mayor. Just great to have you back, Mayor. That's it. Mm -hmm. Councilman Padilla. Councilwoman Nager. I was remiss in not mentioning that about two weeks ago, Councilwoman Ortiz and I went um, and talked to some Girl Scouts, and 
it was a wonderful experience. It was really great to see these young women get involved in their community and be excited about things and ask good questions. And it's really great to be invited to um, events like that. So make sure that you're reaching out to your city council people and your other representatives so that they can be a part of your life and see all the good that is happening and support it. Councilman Dobler, Councilman Duncan. I'm reporting my mic needs repair or something like that. <laughs> or it could be user error, it's just pushing a button. That's all right. Um, we can help you out. <laughs> I just want to say that uh, at the end of March, of, uh, just so my constituents know, and if you're outside the district and you want to come harass me, that's fine too. I will have a, a community forum in my district. And I've told everybody that you can come talk about any issue, but part of that focus will be on the where they those folks think budget and priorities should be before we take that vote, and I can bring that back to the council. So I, I will put more stuff out soon, but that will happen. So thank you. Big Mike Nine. Uh, I was yeah just a little disappointed. Joe left. He'd given his presentation, and then just kind of took off running uh, because. Uh, Spencer and I've kind of talked about with Brendan about maybe tiny homes around the lake over there um, some lakefront property at, at the park, but uh, Joe left so I didn't get a chance to really to go over the plan with him so woman <laughs> Hiller Well on that note that's Nick, thank you for your service. I'm sure we'll see more of you before you go, but very much appreciate all that you've done. If you like the the, um, the the training squad here, the farm team sending you out, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Thank you, Mayor. Um, city manager and governing body, I have several concerns I would like to bring to your attention. On February 5th, I requested from city clerk and notifying city manager as well to be provided a copy of the City of Topeka contract with lobbyist Whitney Damron. For those um, watching on, on TV still, is uh, our lobbyist Damron is the lobbyist at the Kansas State House. Um, I obtained a copy the next day of his contract on February 6th. I learned through this contract and other research that Mr. Dameron is paid by the city of Topeka almost $40,000 a year and also paid for a number of various expenses. Upon further research, I learned Mr. Dameron has about 25 other clients he lobbies for. What is concerning is up until my request for his contract as a member of this governing body, I had received no communication from Mr. Dameron about lobbying activities for the city of Topeka. Now, suddenly, since February 7th, we have been rather inundated with correspondence from him. I know that we also have the Kansas League of Municipalities that lobbies for us and have received consistent and ongoing communications uh, from them. Uh, however, I'm not sure how much we pay them for their services. Keeping in mind, again, transparency and accountability to the taxpayer, I'm requesting the following, which you have a, a listing of. All expenses paid as listed in paragraph four of Whitney Dameron contract, document number 48186, from January 1st, 2019 to February 8th, 2020. A list of all bills of interest to the city referenced in paragraph A under scope of services. List of all legislation being tracked as referenced in paragraph C under scope of services. List of all individual legislators lobbied as referenced under paragraph F under scope of services. Please include the name of legislator, date of lobbying, bill number, or description of issue, and any written documents or communications involved in the lobbying. All written testimony presented to the legislative committees from January 1st, 2019 to February 8th, 2020. Thank you. Seeing no additional uh, comments, we would proceed with the executive session. If we have two tonight, and if the city attorney could read the parameters. The motion is to recess into executive session for a period of time not to exceed 15 minutes for consultation with the city's legal counsel to discuss attorney-client privilege matters related to potential litigation as justified by KSA 75-4319B2. 
In order to aid the discussion, the following individuals should be present. Members of the governing body, City Manager Brent Trout, Deputy City Manager Doug Gerber, Financial and Administrative Services Director Jessica Lamandola, Associate City Attorney Nick Jefferson and myself. No action is anticipated to be taken when the open meeting resumes in the governing body chambers. We have heard the parameters of the executive session. What is the pleasure of the body? De second. Deputy Mayor makes the motion. There's a second by Councilman Dobler. Seeing no comments or questions, we proceed by voting. There will be a five minute recess before we enter into the executive session. We have 10 yes. 10 having voting yes, the motion passes. We will have a five minute recess and then we will adjourn into executive session. And hit the street. We have exited the executive session and we find ourselves with a need to extend the time for 10 additional minutes. Um, at this point in time, do we have a motion for that extension? We have a motion, second. we have a second. The voting that we're going to do is gonna be by raising our hand. It is under the same parameters that were indicated in the first session. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries unanimously. We will enter into the same executive session not to exceed 10 minutes. We have complete, concluded the first executive session. No action has been taken. There is a need for a second executive session. If the city attorney could please read the parameters. The motion is to recess into executive session for a period of time not to exceed 30 minutes to discuss confidential employment matters pertaining to non-elected personnel as justified by KSA 75-4319B1 in order to protect the privacy of those discussed. Members of the governing body should be present for discussion initially with City Manager Brent Trout to join the discussion when called upon. No action will be taken when the open meeting resumes in the governing body chambers. We have heard the parameters of the meeting. Do we have a motion? So moved. We have a motion by the Deputy Mayor. Second. We have a second by Councilwoman Nager. Uh, additional comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We now ex uh, recess into the second executive session. Thank you for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> We have a need to extend the current executive session for an additional 30 minutes. However, in addition to that, we need a motion to extend past the 10 o'clock mark. So do we have a motion to do so? We have a motion by Councilwoman Nager. We have a second by Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. All those in favor of extending our time to go beyond the 10 o'clock threshold, please raise your right hand. All opposed, same sign. And we have members in the back that are walking in that agree. So the motion carries. We will now reconvene the initial executive session and have extended 30 minutes to that session. We have concluded our executive session. No action has been taken. The meeting is adjourned.